adventures of huckleberry finn tom sawyer's comrade by mark twain chapter ten after breakfast i wanted to talk about the dead man and guess out how he come to be killed but jim didn't want to he said it would fetch bad luck and besides he said he might come and hunt us he said a man that warned buried was more likely to go a hanting around than one that was planted and comfortable that sounded pretty reasonable so i didn't say no more but i couldn't keep from studying over it and wishing i know who shot the man and what they done it for we rummaged the clothes we got and found eight dollars in silver soda in the lining of an old blanket overcoat jim said he reckoned the people in that house stole the coat because if they'd a know the money was there they wouldn't a left it i said i reckon they killed him too but jim didn't want to talk about that i says now you think it's bad luck but what did you say when i fetched in the snake skin that i found on the top of the ridge day before yesterday you said it was the worst bad luck in the world to touch a snake skin with my hands well here's your bad luck we've raked in all this truck and eight dollars besides i wish we could have some bad luck like this every day jim never you mind honey never you mind don't you get to pert it's a common mind i tell you it's a common it did come too it was a tuesday that we had that talk well after dinner friday we was laying around in the grass at the upper end of the ridge and got out of tobacco i went to the cavern to get some and found a rattlesnake in there i killed him and curled him up on the foot of jim's blanket ever so natural thinking there'd be some fun when jim found him there well by night i forgot all about the snake and when jim flung himself down on the blanket well i struck a light his snake's mate was there and bit him he jumped up yelling and the first thing the light showed was the varmint curled up and ready for another spring i laid him out in a second with a stick and jim grabbed pap's whiskey jug and begun to pour it down he was barefooted and the snake bit him right on the heel that all comes of my being such a fool as to not remember that wherever you leave a dead snake its mate always comes there and curls around it din told me to chop off the snake's head and throw it away and then skin the body and roast a piece of it i'd gone it and he ate it and said it would help cure him he made me take off the rattles and tie them around his wrist too he said that that would help then i slid out quiet and throwed the snakes clear away amongst the bushes though i weren't going to let jim find out it was all my fault not if i could help it jim sucked and sucked at the jug and now and then he got out of his head and pitched around and yelled but every time he come to himself he went to sucking at the jug again his foot swelled up pretty big and so did his leg but by and by the drunk begun to come and so i judged he was all right but i'd rather been bit with a snake than pap's whiskey jim was laid up for for days and nights then the swelling was all gone and he was around again i made up my mind i wouldn't ever take a hold of a snakeskin again with my hands now that i see what had come of it jim said he reckoned i would believe him next time and he said that handling a snakeskin was such awful bad luck that maybe we hadn't got to the end of it yet he said he drew the see the new moon it over his left shoulder as much as a thousand times and take of a snake skin in his hand well i was getting to feel that way myself though i've always reckoned that looking at the new moon over your left shoulder is one of the carelessest and foolishest things a body can do old hank bunker done it once and bragged about it and in less than two years he got drunk and fell off of the shot tower and spread himself out so that he was just a kind of a layer as you may say and they slid him edgeways between two barn doors for a coffin and buried him so so they say but i didn't see it pap told me but anyway you all come of looking at the moon that way like a fool well 
the days went along and the river went down between its banks again and about the first thing we done was to bait one of the big hooks with a skinned rabbit and set it and catch a catfish that was as big as a man being six foot two inches long and weighed over two hundred pounds we couldn't handle him of course he would have flung us into illinois we just sat there and watched him writ and tear around till he drowned we found a brass button in his stomach and a round ball and lots of rubbish we split the ball open with the hatchet and there was a spool in it jem said he had it there a long time to coat it over so and make a ball of it it was as big a fish as was ever catched in the mississippi i reckon jim said he hadn't ever seen a bigger one he would have been worth a good deal over at the village they peddle out such a fish as that by the pound in the market house there everybody buys some of him his meat's as white as snow and makes a good fry next morning i said it was getting slow and dull and i wanted to get a stirring up some way i said i reckoned i would slick over the river and find out what was going on jim liked that notion but he said i must go in the dark and look sharp then he studied it over and said couldn't i put on some of them old things and dress up like a girl that was a good notion too so we shortened up one of the calico gowns and i turned up my trouser legs to my knees and got into it jim hitched it behind with the hooks and it was a fair fit i put on the sunbonnet and tied it under my chin and then for a body to look in and see my face was like looking down a joint of stovepipe jim said nobody would know me even in the daytime hardly i practiced around all day to get the hang of the things and by and by i could do pretty well in them only jim said i didn't walk like a girl and he said i must quit pulling up my gown to get at my breeches pocket i took notice and done better i started up the illinois shore in the canoe just after dark i started across to the town from a little below the ferry landing and the drift of the current fetched me in at the bottom of the town i tied up and started along the bank there was a light burning in a little shanty that hadn't been lived in for a long time and i wondered who had took up quarters there i slipped up and peeped in at the window there was a woman about forty year old in there knitting by a candle that was on a pine table i didn't know her face she was a stranger for you couldn't start a face in that town that i didn't know now this was lucky because i was weakening i was getting afraid i had come people might know my voice and find me out but if this woman had been in such a little town to days she could tell me all i wanted to know so i knocked at the door and made up my mind i wouldn't forget i was a girl chapter eleven come in says the woman and i did she says take it cheer i done it she looked me all over with her little shiny eyes and says what might your name be sarah williams whereabouts do you live in this neighborhood no in hookerville seven mile below i've walked all the way and i'm all tired out hungry too i reckon i'll find you something no i ain't hungry i was so hungry i had to stop two miles below here at a farm so i ain't hungry no more it's what makes me so late my mother's down sick and out of money and everything and i come to tell my uncle abner moore he lives at the upper end of the town she says i hain't ever been here before do you know him no but i don't know everybody yet i haven't lived here quite two weeks it's a considerable ways to the upper end of the town you better stay here all night take off your bonnet no i says i'll rest a while i reckon and go on i ain't afeard of the dark she said she wouldn't let me go by myself but her husband would be in by and by maybe an hour and a half and she'd send him along with me then she got to talking about her husband 
and about her relations up the river and her relations down the river and about how much better off they used to us and how they didn't know but they'd made a mistake coming to our town instead of letting well alone and so on and so on till i was afeard i had made a mistake coming to her to find out what was going on in the town up by and by she dropped on to pab and the murder and then i was pretty willing to let her clatter right along she told about me and tom sawyer finding the six thousand dollars only she got it ten and all about pat and what a hard lot he was and what a hard lot i was and at last she got down to where i was murdered i says who done it we've heard considerable about these goings on down in huckerville but we don't know who twas that killed huck finn well i reckon there's a right smart chance of people here that'd like to know who killed him some think old finn done it himself no is that so most everybody thought it at first he'll never know how nigh he come to getting lynched but before night a changed around and judged it was done by a runaway nigger named jim why he i stopped i reckoned i'd better keep still she run on and never noticed i had put in at all the nigger run off the very night huck finn was killed so there's a reward out for him three hundred dollars and there's a reward out for old finn too two hundred dollars you see he come to town the morning after the murder and told about it and was out with him on the ferry boat hunt and right away after he up and left the forenight they wanted to lynch him but he was gone you see well next day they found out the nigger was gone they found out he hadn't been seen since ten o'clock the night the murder was done so then they put it on him you see and while they was full of it next day back comes old finn and went behoing to judge thatcher to get money to hud for the nigger all over illinois with the judge gave him some and that evening he got drunk and was around till after midnight with a couple of mighty hard-looking strangers and then went off with them well he hain't come back since and they ain't looking for him back till this thing blows over a little for people think now that he killed his boy and fixed things so folks would think robbers done it and then he'd get huck's money without having to bother a long time of a lawsuit people do say he weren't any too good to do it oh he's sly i reckon if he don't come back for a year he'll be all right you can't prove anything on him you know everything will be quieted down then and he'll walk in huck's money as easy as nothing yes i reckon so m i don't see nothing in the way of it has everybody quit thinking when nigger done it oh no not everybody a good many thinks he done it but they'll get the nigger pretty soon now and maybe they can scare it out of him why are they after him yet well you're innocent ain't you does three hundred dollars lay around every day for people to pick up some folks think the nigger ain't far from here i'm one of them i hain't top it around a few days ago i was talking with an old couple that lies next door in the log shanty and they happened to say hardly anybody ever goes to the island over yonder that they call daxon's island don't anybody live there says i no nobody says they i didn't say any more but i'd done some thinking i was pretty near certain i'd seen smoke over there about the head of the island a day or two before that so i says to myself like as not that nigger's hiding over there anyway says i it's worth the trouble to give the place a hunt i hain't seen any smoke sense so i reckon maybe he's gone if it was him but husband's going over to see him and another man he was gone up the river but he got back two day and i told him as soon as he got here two hours ago i had got so uneasy i couldn't set still i had to do something with my hands so i took up a needle off of the table and went to threading it my hands shook 
and I was making a bad job of it. When the woman stopped talking, I looked up, and she was looking at me pretty curious and smiling a little. I put down the needle and thread, and let on to be interested. And I was, too, and says, Three hundred dollars is a power of money. I wish my mother could get it. Is your husband going over there tonight? Oh, yes. He went uptown with the man I was telling you of to get a boat and see if they could borrow another gun. They'll go over after midnight. Couldn't they see better if they was to wait till daytime? Yes. And couldn't the nigger see better, too? After midnight, he'll likely be asleep, and they can slip around through the woods and hunt up his campfire all the better for the dark, if he's got one. I didn't think of that. The woman kept looking at me pretty curious, and I didn't feel a bit comfortable. Pretty soon, she says, What did you say your name was, honey? M. Mary Williams. Somehow it didn't seem to me that I said it was Mary before, so I didn't look hug. Seemed to me I said it was Sarah. So I felt sort of cornered, and was afeard maybe I was looking it too. I wished the woman would say something more. The longer she sat still, the uneasier I was. But now she says, Honey, I thought you said it was Sarah when you first come in. Oh, yes, I did. Sarah Mary Williams. Sarah's my first name. Some calls me Sarah, some calls me Mary. Oh, that's the way of it. Yes, and I was feeling better then, but I wished I was out of there. Anyway, I couldn't look up yet. Well, the woman fell to talking about how hard times was and how poor they had to live, and how the rats was as free as if they owned the place, and so forth and so on, and then I got easy again. She was right about the rats. You'd see one stick his nose out of a hole in the corner every little while. She said she had to have things handy to throw at them when she was alone, or they wouldn't give her no peace. She showed me a bar of lead twisted up into a knot, and said she was a bit shot with it generally, but she wrenched her arm a day or two ago, and didn't know whether she could throw her true now. But she watched for a chance, and directly banged away at a rat. But she missed him wide and said, Ouch! It hurt her arm so. Then she told me to try for the next one. I wanted to be getting away before the old man got back, but of course I didn't let on. I got the thing, and the first rat that showed his nose I let drive. And if he'd a stayed where he was, he'd a been a tolerable sick rat. She said that was for straight, and she reckoned I would hive the next one. She went and got the lump of the lead and fetched it back and brought along a hank of yarn which she wanted me to help her with. I held up my two hands, and she put the hank over them and went on talking about her and her husband's matters. But she broke off to say, Keep your eye on the rats. You better have the lead in your lap handy. So she dropped the lump into my lap just at that moment, and I clapped my legs together on it, and she went on talking. But only about a minute. Then she took off the hank and looked me straight in the face, and very pleasant, and says, Come, now, what's your real name? Boo. What, mum? What's your real name? Is it Bill, or Tom, or Bob? Or what is it? I reckon I shook like a leaf, and I didn't know hardly what to do. But I says, Please to don't poke fun at a poor girl like me, Mum. If I'm in the way here, I'll. No, you won't. Set down and stay where you are. I ain't going to hurt you, and I ain't going to tell on you neither. You just tell me your secret, and trust me, I'll keep it. And what's more, I'll help you. Sole my old man if you want him to. You see, you're a runaway prentice. That's all. It ain't anything. There ain't no harm in it. You've been treated bad, and you made up your mind to cut. Bless you, child, 
I wouldn't tell on you. Tell me all about it now. That's a good boy. So I said wouldn't be no use to try to play it any longer, and I would just make a clean breast and tell her everything, but she mustn't go back on her promise. Then I told her my father and mother was dead, and the law had bound me out to a mean old farmer in the country thirty mile back from the river, and he treated me so bad I couldn't stand it no longer. He went away to be gone a couple of days, and so I took my chance and stole some of his daughter's old clothes and cleared out, and I had been three nights coming the thirty miles. I traveled nights, and hid daytimes and slept, and the bat of bread and meat I carried from home lasted me all the way, and I had a plenty. I said I believed my uncle Abner Moore would take care of me, and so that was why I struck out for this town of Goshen. Goshen, child? This ain't Goshen. This is St. Petersburg. Goshen's ten mile further up the river. Who told you this was Goshen? Why, a man I met at daybreak this morning, just as I was going to turn into the woods for my regular sleep. He told me when the roads forked I must take the right hand, and five mile would fetch me to Goshen. He was drunk, I reckon. He told you just exactly wrong. Well, he did act like he was drunk, but it ain't no matter now. I got to be moving along. I'll fetch Goshen before daylight. Hold on a minute. I'll put you up a snack to eat. You might want it. So she put me up a snack and says, Say, when a cow's laying down, which end of her gets up first? Answer up prompt now. Don't stop to study over it. Which end gets up first? A hind end, mum. Well, then, a horse. The forward end, mum. Which side of a tree does the moss grow on? North side. If fifteen cows is browsing on a hillside, how many of them eats with their heads pointed the same direction? The whole fifteen, mum. Well, I reckon you have lived in the country. I thought maybe you was trying to hopus me again. What's your real name now? George Peters, mum. Well, try to remember it, George. Don't forget, and tell me it's Alexander before you go, and then de out by saying it's George Alexander when I catch you. And don't go about women in that old calico. You do, girl, tolerable poor. But you might fool men. Maybe. Bless you, child. When you set out to thread a needle, don't hold the thread still and fetch the needle up to it. Hold the needle still and poke the thread at it. That's the way a woman most always does, but a man always does t'other way. And when you throw at a rat or anything, hitch yourself up a tiptoe and fetch your hand up over your head as awkward as you can and miss your rat about six or seven foot. Throw stiff arm from the shoulder, like there was a pivot there for it to turn on, like a girl, not from the wrist and elbow, with your arm out to one side, like a boy. And mind you, when a girl tries to catch anything in her lap, she throws her knees apart. She don't clap them together, the way you did when you patched the lump of lead. Why, I spotted you for a boy when you was threading the needle, and I contrived the other things just to make certain. Now trot along to your uncle, Sarah Mary Williams, George Alexander Peters, and if you get into trouble you send word to Mrs. Judith Loftus, which is me, and I'll do what I can to get you out of it. Keep the river road all the way, and next time you tramp tick shoes and socks with you. The river road's a rocky one and your feet'll be in a condition when you get to Goshen, I reckon. I went up the bank about fifty yards, and then I doubled on my tracks and slipped back to where my canoe was, a good piece below the house. I jumped in, and was off in a hurry. I went upstream far enough to make the head of the island, and then started across. I took off the sun bonnet, for I didn't want no blinders on then, when I was about the mill I heard the clock begin to strike, so I stops and listens. 
the sound come faint over the water but clear eleven when i struck the head of the island i never waited to blow though i was most winded but a shove right into the timber where my old camp used to be and started a good fire there on a high and dry spot then i jumped in the canoe and dug out for our place a mile and a half below as hard as i could go i landed and slopped through the timber and up the ridge and into the cavern there jim laid sound asleep on the ground i roused him out and says get up and hump yourself jim there ain't a minute to lose they're after us jim never asked no questions he never said a word but the way he worked for the next half an hour showed about how he was scared by that time everything we had in the world was on our raft and she was ready to be shoved out from the willow cove where she was hid. he put out the camp fire at the cavern the first thing and didn't show a candle outside after that i took the canoe out from the shore a little piece and took a look but if there was a boat around i couldn't see it for stars and shadows ain't good to see by then we got out the raft and slipped along down in the shade cast the foot of the island dead still never saying a word chapter twelve it must have been close on to one o'clock when we got below the island at last and the raft did seem to go mighty slow if a boat was to come along we was going to take to the canoe and break for the illinois shore and it was well a boat didn't come for we hadn't ever thought to put the gun in the canoe or a fishing line or anything to eat we was in ruther too much of a sweat to think of so many things it warn't good judgment to put everything on the raft if the men went to the island i just expect they found the camp fire i built and watched it all night for jim to come anyways they stayed away from us and if my building the fire never fooled them it warn't no fault of mine i played it as low down on them as i could when the first streak of day began to show we tied up to a towhead in a big bend on the illinois side and hacked off cottonwood branches with the hatchet and covered up the raft with them so she looked like there had been a cave in in the bank there a towhead is a sandbar that has cottonwoods on it as thick as harrow teeth we had mountains on the missouri shore and heavy timber on the illinois side and the channel was down the missouri shore at that place so we weren't afraid of anybody running across us we lay there all day and watched the raft and steamboats spin down the missouri shore and upbound steamboats fight the big river in the middle i told jim all about the time i had jabbering with that woman and jim says she was a smart one and if she was to start after us herself she wouldn't sit down and watch a campfire no sir she'd fetch a dog well then i said why couldn't she tell her husband to fetch a dog jim said he bet she did think of it by the time the men was ready to start and he believed they must have gone uptown to get a dog and so they lost all that time or else we wouldn't be here on a towhead sixteen or seventeen mile below the village no indeedy we would be in that same old town again so i said i didn't care what was the reason they didn't get us as long as they didn't when it was beginning to come on dark we poked our heads out of the cottonwood thicket and looked up and down and across nothing in sight so jim took up some of the top planks of the raft and built the snug wigwam to get under in blazing weather and rainy and to keep the things dry jim made a floor for the wigwam and raised it a foot or more above the level of the raft so now the blankets and all the traps was out of reach of steamboat waves right in the middle of the wigwam we made a layer of dirt about five or six inches deep with a frame around it for to hold it to its place this was to build a fire on in sloppy weather or chilly the wigwam would keep it from being seen we made an extra steering oar too because one of the others might get broke on a snag or something we fixed up a short forked stick 
to hang the old lantern on because we must always light the lantern whenever we see a steamboat coming downstream to keep from getting run over but we wouldn't have to light it for upstream boats unless we see we was in what they call a crossing for the river was pretty high yet very low banks being still a little under water so upbound boats didn't always run the channel but punted easy water his second night we run between seven and eight hours with a current that was making over for mile an hour we catched fish and talk and we took a swim now and then to keep us sleepiness it was kind of solemn drifting down the big still river lay on our backs looking up at the stars and we didn't ever feel like talking loud and it weren't often that we laughed only a little kind of a low chuckle we had mighty good weather as a general thin and nothing ever happened to us at all that night nor the next nor the next every night we passed towns some of them away up on black hillsides nothing but just a shiny bed of lights not a house could you see the fifth night we passed saint louis and it was like the whole world lit up in saint petersburg they used to say there was twenty or thirty thousand people in saint louis but i never believed it till i see that wonderful spread of lights at two o'clock that still might there weren't a sound there everybody was asleep every night now i'd used to slip ashore towards ten o'clock at some little village and buy ten or fifteen cents worth of meal or bacon or other stuff to eat and sometimes i lifted a chicken that warned roosting comfortable and took him along pap always said take a chicken when you get a chance because if you don't want him yourself you can easy find somebody that does and a good deed ain't ever forgot I never see pap when he didn't want the chicken himself but that is what he used to say anyway mornings before daylight i slipped into cornfields and borrowed a watermelon or a mushmelon or a pumpkin or some new corn or things of that kind pap always said it warn't no harm to borrow things if you was meaning to pay them back some time but the widow said it warn't anything but a soft name for stealing and no decent buy would do it jim said he reckoned the widow was partly right and pap was partly right so the best way would be for us to pick out two or three things from the list and say we wouldn't borrow them any more then he reckoned it wouldn't be no harm to borrow the others so we talked it over all one night drifting along down the river trying to make up our minds whether to drop the watermelons or the cantaloupes or the mushmelons or what the towards daylight we got it all settled satisfactory and concluded to drop probables and simmons we weren't feeling just right before that but it was all comfortable now i was glad the way it come out too because crabapples ain't ever good and the simmons wouldn't be ripe for two or three months yet we shot a waterfowl now and then that caught up too early in the morning or didn't go to bed early enough in the evening take it all round we lived pretty high the fifth night below saint louis we had a big storm after midnight with a power of thunder and lightning and the rain poured down in a solid sheet we stayed in the wigwam and let the raft take care of itself when the lightning glared out we could see a big straight river ahead and high rocky bluffs on both sides by and by says i hello jim look a yonder it was a steamboat that had killed herself on a rock we was drifting straight down for her the lightning showed her very distinct she was leaning over with part of her upper deck above water and you could see every little chimbley guy clean and clear and a chair by the big bell with an old slouch head hanging on the back of it when the flashes come well it being away in the night and stormy and all so mysterious like i felt just the way any other boy would have felt when i see that wreck laying there so mournful and lonesome in the middle of the river i wanted to get aboard of her and sleep around a little and see what there was there so i says 
Liz land on her, Jim. But Jim was dead against it at first. He says, I don't want to go fool and long or no rack. We's doing blame well, and we'd better let blame well alone, as de good book says. Like as not days a watchman on deck rack. Watchman, your grandmother, I says. There ain't nothing to watch but the Texas and the pilot house. And do you reckon anybody's going to risk his life for a Texas and a pilot house such a night as this, when it's likely to break up and wash off down the river any minute? Jim couldn't say nothing to that, so he didn't try. And besides, I says, we might borrow something worth having out of the captain's stateroom. Seegers, I bet you, and cost five cents apiece, solid cash. Steamboat captains is always rich and get sixty dollars a month, and they don't care a cent what a thing costs, you know, long as they want it. Stick a candle in your pocket. I can't rest, Jim, till we give her a rummaging. Do you reckon Tom Sawyer would ever go by this thing? Not for pie, he wouldn't. He'd call it an adventure. That's what he'd call it. And he'd land on that wreck if it was his last act. And wouldn't he throw style into it? Wouldn't he spread himself, nor nothing? Why, you'd think it was Christopher Columbus discovering kingdom come. I wish Tom Sawyer was here. Jim, he grumbled a little but give in. He said we mustn't talk any more than we could help, and then talk mighty low. The lightning showed us the wreck again just in time, and we fetched the starboard derrick and made fast there. The deck was high out here. We went sneaking down the slope of it to larboard in the dark, towards the Texas, feeling our way slow with our feet, and spreading our hands out to fend off the guys, for it was so dark, we couldn't see no sign of them. Pretty soon we struck the forward end of the skylight, and clumb on to it, and the next step fetched us in front of the captain's door, which was open, and by Jiminy, away down through the Texas hall we see a light, and all in the same second we seemed to hear low voices in yonder. Jim whispered and said he was feeling powerful sick, and told me to come along. I says, all right, and was going to start for the raft. But just then I heard a voice wail out and say, Oh, please don't, boys. I swear I won't ever tell. Another voice said, pretty loud, Fix a lie, Jim Turner. You've acted this way before. You always want more than your share of the truck, and you've always got it, too because you've swore if you didn't you'd tell. But this time you've said it just one time too many. You're the meanest, treacherousest hound in this country. By this time Jim was gone for the raft. I was just a-biling with curiosity. And I says to myself, Tom Sawyer wouldn't bat out now, and so I won't either. I'm a-going to see what's going on here. So I dropped on my hands and knees in the little passage and crept aft in the dark till there warned but one stitteroom betwixt me and the cross hall of the Texas. Then in there I see a man stretched on the floor and tied hand and foot, and two men standing over him, and one of them had a dim lantern in his hand, and the other one had a pistol. This one kept pointing the pistol at the man's head on the floor and saying, I'd like to, and I'd order to, a mean skulk. The man on the floor would shrivel up and say, Oh, please don't, Bill. I hain't ever going to tell. And every time he said that the man with the lantern would laugh and say, D you ain't. You never said no truer thing that you bet you. And once he said, Hear him beg. And yet, if we hadn't got the best of him and tied him, he'd it killed us both. And what for? just for nothing, just because we stood on our rights. That's what for. But I lay you ain't a boing to threaten nobody any more, Jim Turner. Put up that pistol, Bill. Bill says, I don't want to, Jig Packard. 
I'm for killing him. And didn't he kill old Hatfield just the same way? And don't he deserve it? But I don't want him killed, and I've got my reasons for it. Bless your heart for them words, Jake Packer. I'll never forget it you longs I live, says the man on the floor, sort of blubbering. Packer didn't take no notice of that, but hung up his lantern on a nail and started towards where I was there in the dark, and motioned Bill to come. I crawfished as fast as I could about two yards, but the boat slanted so that I couldn't make very good time. So to keep from getting run over, and catched I crawled into a stateroom on the upper side. The man came a-pawing along in the dark, and when Packard got to my stateroom, he says, Here, come in here. And then he come and Bill after him. But before they got in, I was up in the upper berth, cornered, and sorry I come. Then they stood there, with their hands on the ledge of the berth, and talked. I couldn't see them, but I could tell where they was by the whiskey they'd been having. I was glad I didn't drink whiskey. But it wouldn't made much difference anyway, because most of the time, they couldn't a treat me because I didn't breathe. I was too scared. And... Besides, a body couldn't breathe and hear such talk. They talked low and earnest. Bill wanted to kill Turner. He says, He said he'll tell, and he will. If we was to give both our shares to him now, it wouldn't make no difference after the row, and the way we've served him. Sure as you're born, he'll turn state's evidence. Now you hear me. I'm for putting him out of his troubles. So am I, says Packard, very quiet. Blame it, I'd sort of begun to think you wasn't. Well, then, that's all right. Let's go and do it. Hold on a minute. I hain't had my say yet. You listen to me. Shooting's good, but there's quieter ways if the thing's got to be done. But what I say is this. It ain't good sense to go courtin' around after a halter if you can get at what you're up to in some way. That's just as good, and at the same time don't bring you into no risks. Ain't that so? You bet it is. But how are you going to manage it this time? Well, my idea is this. We'll rustle around and gather up whatever pickings we've overlooked in the state rooms and chauffeur ashore and hide the truck. Then we'll wait. Now, I say it ain't the boy to be mourn two hours before this rack breaks up and washes off down the river. See, he'll be drowned and won't have nobody to blame for it but his own self. I reckon that's a considerable sight better in killing of him. I'm unfavorable to killing a man as long as you can get around it. It ain't good sense. It ain't good morals. Ain't I right? Yes, I reckon you are. But suppose she don't break up and wash off. Well, we can wait the two hours anyway and see, can't we? All right, men. Come along. So they started, and I lit out, all in a cold sweat, and scrambled forward. It was dark as pitched bare. But I said in a kind of a coarse whisper, Jim, and he answered up right at my elbow, with a sort of a moan, and I says, Quake, Jim, they ain't no time for fooling around and moaning. There's a gang of murderers in yonder, and if we don't hunt up their boat and set her drifting down the river so these fellows can't get away from the wreck, there's one of them going to be in a bad fix. But if we find their boat, we can put all of them in a bad fix, for the sheriff will get him. Quick, Harry, I'll hunt the labboard side. You hunt the stabboard. You start at the raft and... Oh, my lordy, lordy, raft. Day ain't no raft no mo. She done broke loose and gone I. And here we is. Chapter 13 Well, I catched my breath and most fainted. Shut up on a wreck with such a gang as that... But it weren't no time to be sentimenturing. We'd got to find that boat now. 
add to have it for ourselves so we went it quaking and shaking down the stabboard side and slow work it was too seemed to weep before we got to the stern no sign of a boat jim said he didn't believe he could go any further so scared he hadn't hardly any strength left he said but i said come on if we get left on this wreck we are in a fix sure so on we prowled again we struck for the stern of the texas and found it and then scrabbled along forwards on the skylight hanging on from shutter to shutter for the edge of the skylight was in the water when we got pretty close to the cross hall door there was the skiff sure enough i could just barely see her i felt ever so thankful in another second i would have been aboard of her but just then the door opened one of the men stuck his head out only about a couple of foot from me and i thought i was gone but he jerked it in again and says eve that blame lantern out of sight bill he flung a bag of something into the boat and then got in himself and sat down it was packard then bill he come out and got in packard says in a low voice all ready shove off i couldn't hardly hang on to the shutters i was so weak but bill says hold on do you go through him no didn't do no so he's got his share o the cash yet well then come along no use to take truck and leave money say won't he suspicion what we're up to maybe he won't but we got to have it anyway come along so they got out and went in the door slammed to because it was on the careen side and in a half second i was in the boat and jan come tumbling after me i out with my knife and cut the rope and away we went we didn't touch an oar and we didn't speak nor whisper nor hardly even breathe we went flying swift along dead silent past the tip of the paddle box and past the stern then in a second or two more we was a hundred yards below the wreck and the darkness soaked her up every last sign of her and we was safe and knowed it when we was three or four hundred yards downstream we see the lantern show like a little spark at the texas door for a second and we knowed by that that the rascals had missed their boat and was beginning to understand that they was in just as much trouble now as jim turner was then jim manned the oars and we took out after our raft now was the first time that i begun to worry about the men i reckon i hadn't had time to before i begun to think how dreadful it was even for murderers to be in such a fix i says to myself there ain't no telling but i might come to be a murderer myself yet and then how would i like it so said i to jim the first light we see we land a hundred yards below it or above it in a place where it's a good hiding place for you and the skiff and then i'll go and fix up some kind of a yarn and get somebody to go for that gang and get them out of their scrape so they can be hung when their time comes but the idea was a failure for pretty soon it begun to storm again and this time worse than ever the rain poured down and never a light showed everybody in bed i reckon we boom along down the river watching for lights and watching for our raft after a long time the rain let up but the clown stayed and the lightning kept whimpering and by and by a flash showed us a black thing ahead floating and we made for it it was the raft and mighty glad was we to get aboard of it again we seen a light now away down to the right on shore so i said i would go for it the skiff was half full of plunder which that gang had stole there on the wreck we hustled it on to the raft in a pile and i told jim to float a long gown and show a light when he judged he had gone about two mile and keep it burning till i come then i manned my oars and shoved for the light as i got down towards it three or four more showed up on a hillside it was a village 
I closed in above the shore light and laid on my oars and floated. As I went by, I see it was a lantern hanging on the jack-saff of a double-hull ferry boat. I skimmed around for the watchman, a wondering whereabouts he slept, and by and by I found him roosting on the bits forward with his head down between his knees. I gave his shoulder two or three little shoves and begun to cry. He stirred up in a kind of a startlish way, but when he see it was only me, he took a good gap and stretch, and then he says, Hello, what's up? Don't cry, Bob. What's the trouble? I says, Cap and Mom and Sis, and then I broke down. He says, Oh, damn it now, don't take on so. We all has who have our troubles, and this'll all come out all right. What's the matter with them? There, there, are you the watchman of the boat? Yes, he says, kind of pretty well satisfied like. I'm the captain and the owner and the mate and the pilot and watchman and head deck hand. And sometimes I'm the freight and passengers. I ain't as rich as old Jim Hornback, and I can't be so blame generous and good to Tom, Dick, and Harry as what he is, and slam around money the way he does. But I've told him a many a time I wouldn't trade places with him. For, says I, a sailor's life's the life for me, and I am derned if I'd live two mile out o' town, where there ain't nothing ever going on, not for all his spondulics, and as much more on top of it. Says I, I broke in and says, They're in an awful peck of trouble, and who is? Why, Pap and Mom and Sis and Miss Hooker, and if you'd take your ferry boat and go up there. Up where? Where are they? On the wreck. What wreck? Why, there ain't but one. What, you don't mean the Walter Scott? Yes. Good land. What are they doing there, for gracious sakes? Well, they didn't go there a purpose. I bet they didn't. Why, great goodness, there ain't no chance for em if they don't get off mighty quick. Why, how in the nation did they ever get into such a strait? Easy enough. Miss Hooker was a visiting up there to the town. Yes, Booth's Landing. Go on. She was a visiting there at Booth's Landing, and just in the edge of the evening, she started over with her nigger woman in the horse ferry to stay all night at her friend's house. Miss what you may call her, I disremember her name. And they lost their steer in oar and swung around and went, a floating down, stern first, about two mile, and saddle backed on the rack, and the ferryman and the nigger woman and the horses was all lost. But Miss Hooker, she made a grab and got aboard the wreck. Well, about an hour after dark, we come along down in our trading scow, and it was so dark we didn't notice the wreck till we was right on it. And so we settled bags. But all of us was saved but Bill Whipple. And oh, he was the best crisher. I most wish it had been me. I do. My George, it's the beatenest thing I ever struck. And then what did you all do? Well, we hollered and took on, but it's so wide there we couldn't make nobody hear. So Pap said somebody got to get ashore and get help somehow. I was the only one that could swim, so I made a dash for it, and Miss Hooker, she said, if I didn't strut help sooner, come here and hunt up her uncle, and he'd fix the thing. I made the land about a mile below, and been fooling along ever since, trying to get people to do something. But they said, what, in such a night and such a current? There ain't no sense in it. Go for the steam ferry. Now, if you'll go and... By Jackson, I'd like to. And, blame it, I don't know, but I will. Oh, who in the dignation's a going to pay for it? Do you reckon your path? Why, that's all right. Miss Hooker, she told me, particular, that her uncle horned back. Great guns. Is he her uncle? 
looky here you break for that light over yonder way and turn up west when you get there and about a quarter of a mile out you'll come to the tavern tell em to dart you out to jim hornbacks and he'll foot the bill and don't you fool around any because keel will want to know the news tell him i'll have his niece all safe before he can get to town hump yourself now I'm a going up around the corner here to rust out my engineer. I struck for the light, but as soon as he turned the corner, I went back and got into my skiff and bailed her out, and then pulled up shore in the easy water about six hundred yards and tucked myself in among some wood boats, for I couldn't rest easy till I could see the ferry boat start. But take it all round. I was feeling rather comfortable on accounts of taking all this trouble for a that gang, for not many would have done it. I wished the widow knowed about it. I judge she would be proud of me for helping these rapscallions, because rapscallions and dead beats is the kind the widow and good people takes the most interest in. Well, before long, here comes the rag, dem and dusty, sliding along down. A kind of cold shiver went through me and then i struck out for her she was very deep and i see in a minute there warn't much chance for anybody being alive in her i pulled all around her and hollered a little but there wasn't any answer all dead still i felt a little bit heavy-hearted about the can but not much for i reckoned if they could spend it i could then here comes the ferry boat so i shoved for the middle of the river on a long downstream slant and when i judged i was out of eye reach i laid on my oars and looked back and see her go and smell around the wreck for miss hooker's remainders because the captain would know her uncle hornback would want them and then pretty soon the ferry boat give it up and went for the shore and i laid into my work and went a booming down the river it did seem a powerful long time before jim's light showed up and when it did show it looked like it was a thousand mile off by the time i got there the sky was beginning to get a little gray in the east so we struck for an island and hid the raft and sunk the skiff and turned in and slept like dead people chapter fourteen by and by when we got up we turned over the truck the gang had stole off of the wreck and found boots and blankets and clothes and all sorts of other things and a lot of books and a spike glass and three boxes of seegers we hadn't ever been this rich before in neither at our lives the seegers was prime we laid off all the afternoon in the woods talking and me reading the books and having a general good time I told Jim all about what happened inside the wreck and at the ferry boat, and I said these kinds of things was adventures. But he said he didn't want no more adventures. He said that when I went in the Texas and he crawled back to get on the raft and found her gone, he nearly died. Because he judged it was all up with him, any way it could be fixed. For if he didn't get saved, he would get drowned. And if he did get saved, whoever saved him would send him back home so as to get the reward and then miss watson would sell himself sure well he was right he was most always right he had an uncommon level head for a nigger i read considerable to jim about kings and dukes and earls and such and how gaudy they dressed and how much style they put on and called each other your majesty and your grace and your lordship and so on stead of mister and jen's eyes bugged out and he was interested he says i did no dare with so many on um i hain't hern but none on um scarcely but old king solomon unless you count stim king's dats in a peck or keyards how much do a king get get i says why they get a thousand dollars a month if they want it they can have just as much as they want. Everything belongs to them. Ain't dead gay? And what they got to do, huh? They don't do nothing. Why, how you talk? They just sat around. No. Is dead so? 
Of course it is. They just set around. Except maybe when they're at a war. Then they go to the war. But other times they just lazy around. Or bow hawking. Just hawking and sp as safe sh do you hear a noise? We skipped out and looked. But it warned nothing but the flutter of a steamboat's wheel away down, coming around the point. So we come back. Yes, says I, and other times when things is dull, they fuss with the parliament. And if everybody don't bow just so or he whacks their heads off. But mostly they hang round the harem. Round de witch. Harem. What's de harem? The place where he keeps his wives. Don't you know about the harem? Solomon had one. He had about a million wives. Why, yes, dat's so. I, I done forgot it. A harem's the Bowden house, I reckon. Moss likely day has rackety times in de nursery. And I reckon do wives quarrels considerable. And dat crease do racket. Ye day say Solomon do wise men dat ever low. I don't take no stock in dat. A case why would a wise man want to live in de mids or such a blim la men all de time? No, deed he wouldn't. A wise man a take in buell a biofactory, and den he could shut down de biofactory when he want to raise. Well, but he was the wisest man anyway, because the widow she told me so her own self. I don't care what de widder say, he warn't no wise man nother. He had summer de dead fetched ways I ever see. There's you know about dat chilly dat he used wine to chop in too. Yes, the widow told me all about it. Well, den, warn dat de beaten's notion in de world. You gees take and look at it a minute. Does de stomp dat? Dat's one or de women. Ace you? Dad's de other one, I Solerman, and dish your dollar bills de chilly, both and you claims it. What does I do? Does I shin round mongs de naders and find out which un you de bill do belong to, and han it over to de right one, all safe and sound. De way dead anybody dead had any gumption would. No, I take and whack de bill in two, and give half on it to you. Indeed, you'll there have to dee, you'll woman. Dad's de way Solomon was blind to do wid did chilly. Now I want to ask you, what's de use or dat half a bill? Can't buy nothing wid it. And what use is a half a chilly? I wouldn't give a dern for a million an um. But hang it, Jim, you've clean missed the point. Blame it, you've missed it a thousand mile. Who? Me. The long. Don't talk to me bout your pints. I reckon I knows sense when I sees it. And day ain't no sense in sich doin's as dat. This food warn't bout a half a chilly, this food was bout a whole chilly. And day man dat think he can settle a spoot bout a whole chilly where half a chilly don't know enough to come in out in de rain. Don't talk to me bout Solomon, Hawk. I knows him by de back. But I tell you, you don't get the point. Lame de point. I reckon I knows what I knows. And mind you, de real pint is down further. It's down deeper. It lays in de we Solomon was raised. You take a man, dat's but only one or two chillin. Is dat man gwine to be wasteful o' chillin? No, he ain't. He can't afford it. He know how to value them. But you take a man dat's got bout five million chillin runnin round de house, and it's defunct. He as soon chop a chilly into as a cat. Day's plenty mo. A chilly or two, mo or less, warn't no consequence to Solomon. Dat fetch him. I never see such a nigger. If he got a notion in his head once, there warn't no getting it out again. He was the most down on Solomon of any nigger I ever see. So I went to talking about other kings and let Solomon slide. I told about Louis XVI that got his head cut off in France long time ago, and about his little boy the dolphin that would have been a king 
but they took and shut him up in jail, and some say he died there. Poor little Chad. But some says he got out and got away and come to America. Tax could, but he'll be pooty lonesome. Day ain't no king's dear is day huck. No. Dent he can't get no situation. What he gwine to do? Well, I don't know. Some of them gets on the police, and some of them learns people how to talk French. Why, Huck? Don't de French people talk de same way we does? No, Jim. You couldn't understand a word they said. Not a single word. Well, now I be ding busted. How did dat come? I don't know. But it's so. I thought some of their jabber out of a book. Suppose a man was to come to you and say polly vous frenzy. What would you think? I wouldn't think nothing. I'd take and bust him over de head. Dat is, if he weren't white. I wouldn't loan no nigger to call me dat. Shucks, it ain't calling you anything. It's only saying, do you know how to talk French? Well, den, why couldn't he say it? Why, he is a saying it. That's a Frenchman's way of saying it. Well, it's a blame ridiculous way, and I don't want to hear no more about it. Dey ain't no sense in it. Looky here, Jim. Does a cat talk like we do? No, a cat don't. Well, does a cow? No, a cow don't. Nother. Does a cat talk like a cow, or a cow talk like a cat? No, they don't. It's natural and right for them to talk different from each other, ain't it? Course. And ain't it natural and right for a tat and a cow to talk different from us? By moss jolly it is. Well, then, why ain't it natural and right for a Frenchman to talk different from us? You answer me that. Is a cat a man, Huck? No. Well, den, day ain't no sense in a cat talkin' like a man. Is a cow a man? Or is a cow a cat? No, she ain't either of them. Well, den, she ain't but no business to talk like either one or the other of them. Is a French man a man? Yes. Well, den, dad blame it, why don't he talk like a man? You answer me, dad. I see it weren't no use wasting words. You can't loan a nigger to argue. So I quit. Chapter 15 We judge that three nights more would fetch us to Cairo, at the bottom of Illinois, where the Ohio River comes in, and that was what we was after. We would sell the raft and get on a steamboat and go way up the Ohio amongst the free states, and then be out of trouble. Well, a second night a fog begun to come on, and they made for a towhead to tie to, for it wouldn't do to try to run in a fog. But when I paddled ahead in the canoe, with the line to make fast, there weren't anything but little saplings to tie to. I passed the line around one of them right on the edge of the cut bank, but there was a stiff crud, and the raft come booming down so lively, she tore it out by the roots, and away she went. I see the fog closing down, and it made me so sick and scared I couldn't budge for most a half a minute it seemed to me. And then there weren't no raft in sight. You couldn't see twenty yards. I jumped into the canoe and run back to the stern, and grabbed the paddle and set her back a stroke. But she didn't come. I was in such a hurry I hadn't untied her. I got up and tried to untie her, but I was so excited my hands shook so I couldn't hardly do anything with them. As soon as I got started I took out after the raft, hot and heavy, right down the towhead. That was all right as far as it went, but the towhead warned sixty yards long, and the minute I flew by the foot of it I shot out into the solid white fog and had no more idea which way I was going than a dead man. Thinks I it won't do to paddle. First, I know I'll run into the bank or a towhead or something. I got to set still and float, 
and yet it's mighty fidgety business to have to hold your hands still at such a time i whooped and listened way down there somewhere as i hears a small whoop and up comes my spirits i went tearing after it listening sharp to hear it again the next time it come i see i warn't heading for it but heading away to the right of it and the next time i was heading away to the left of it and not gaining on it much either for i was flying round this way and that and t'other but it was going straight ahead all the time i did wish the fool would think to beat a tin pan and beat it all the time but he never did and it was the still places between the whoops that was making the trouble for me well i fought along and directly i hears the coop behind me i was tangled good now that was somebody else's who or else i was turned around i throwed the paddle down i heard the hoop again it was behind me yet but in a different place it kept coming and kept changing its place and i kept answering till by and by it was in front of me again and i know the current had swung the canoe's head downstream and i was all right if that was jim and not some other raftsman hollering i couldn't tell nothing about voices in a fob for nothing don't look natural nor sound natural in a fob the whooping went on and in about a minute i come a booming down on a cut bank with smoky ghosts of big trees on it and the current throwed me off to the left and shot by amongst a lot of snags that fairly roared the current was tearing by them so swift in another second or two it was solid white and still again i sat perfectly still then listening to my heart thump and i reckon i didn't draw a breath while it thumped a hundred i just gave up then i knowed what the matter was that cut band was an island and jim had gone down to their side of it it warn't no tow head that you could float by in ten minutes it had the big timber of a regular island it might be five or six miles long and more than half a mile wide i kept quiet with my ears cocked about fifteen minutes i reckon i was floating along of course for o'er five miles an hour but you don't ever think of that no you feel like you are laying dead still on the water and if a little glimpse of a snag slips by you don't think to yourself how fast you're going but you catch your breath and think my ow oh, that snag's tearing along if you think it ain't dismal and lonesome out in a fog that way by yourself in the night you try it once you'll see next for about a half an hour i whoops now and then at last i hears the answer a long ways off and tries to follow it but i couldn't do it and directly i judge i'd got into a nest of towheads for i had little dim glimpses of them on both sides of me sometimes just a narrow channel between and some that i couldn't see i knowed was there because i'd hear the wash of the current against the old dead brush and trash that hung over the dance well by warn't long loosing the whoops down amongst the towheads and i only tried to chase them a little while anyway because it was worse than chasing a jack-o'-lantern you never know to sound dodge around so nan swap places so quick and so much i had to claw away from the bank pretty lively for or five times to keep from knocking the islands out of the river and so i judged the raft must be butting into the bank every now and then or else it would get further ahead and clear out of hearing it was floating a little faster than what i was well i seemed to be in the open river again by and by but i couldn't hear no sign of a hoop nowheres i reckon jim had fetched up on a snag maybe and it was all up with him i was good and tired so i laid down in the canoe and said i wouldn't bother no more i didn't want to go to sleep of course but i was so sleepy i couldn't help it so i thought i would take just one little cat nap but i reckon it was more than a cat nap for when i waked up the stars was shining bright the fog was all gone and i was spinning down a big bend stern first first i didn't know where i was i thought i was dreaming 
and when things began to come back to me they seemed to come up dim out of last week it was a monstrous big river here with the tallest and the thickest kind of timber on both banks just a solid wall as well as i could see by the stars i looked away downstream and seen a black speck on the water i took after it but when i got to it it warn't nothing but a couple of salts made fast together then i see another speck and chased that then another and this time i was right it was the raft when i got to it jim was setting there with his head down between his knees asleep with his right arm hanging over the steering oar the other oar was smashed off and the raft was littered up with leaves and branches and dirt so she'd had a rough time i made fast and laid down under jim's nose on the raft and began to gap and stretch my fists out against jim and says hello jim have i been asleep why didn't you stir me up goodness gracious is dead you hot and you ain't dead you ain't drowned use back the gene it's too good for true honey it's too good for true lemma look at you chilly lemma feel o oh, you no you ain't dead use back a gene live in sound jeez de same ol hock de same ol hock thanks to goodness what's the matter with you jim you been a drinking drinking as i been a drinking has i had a chance to be a drinking well man what makes you talk so wild how does i talk wild how my hain't you been talking about my coming back and all that stuff as if i'd been gone away Uck, uck finn you look me in de eye look me in de eye ain't you been gone away gone away why what in the nation do you mean i hain't been gone anywheres where would i go to well looky here boss days something wrong days is i me or who is i is i he or what is i now dat's what i wants to know well i think you're here plain enough but i think you're tangle-headed old fool jim i is his i well you answer me dis didn't you tote out in line and can you fur to make fast to de toe head no i didn't what toe head i hain't seen no toe head you hain't seen no toe head looky here didn't de line pull loose and de raft go a hummin down de river and leave you and de canoe behind in de fog what fog why de fog de fog dat's been around all night and didn't you hoop and didn't i hoop tell we got mix up in de irons and one on us got loss and t'other one was jees as good as loss case he didn't know what he was and didn't i bust up a jean a lot or dem islands and have a terrible time in mosquit drowned yeah ain't dat so boss ain't it so you answer me dat well this is too many for me jim i hain't seen no fog nor no islands nor no troubles nor nothing i've been setting here talking with you all night till you went to sleep about ten minutes ago and i reckon i done the same you couldn't have got drunk in that time so of course you've been dreaming dad fetch it how is i gwine to dream all dat in ten minutes well hang it all you did dream it because there didn't any of it happen but huck it's all g's as plain to me as it don't make no difference how plain it is there ain't nothing in it i know because i've been here all the time jim didn't say nothing for about five minutes but set there studying over it then he says well dan i reckon i did dream it hot but dog my cats if it ain't de powerfulest dream i ever see and i hain't ever had no dream before oh, dat's tired me like dis one oh well that's all right because a dream does tire a body like everything sometimes but 
This one was a staving dream. Tell me all about it, Jim. So Jim went to work and told me the whole thing right through, just as it happened, only he painted it up considerable. And he said he must start and interpret it, because it was sent for a warning. He said the first towhead stood for a man that would try to do us some good, but the current was another man that would get us away from him. The whoops was warnings that would come to us every now and then, and if we didn't try hard to make out to understand them, they'd just take us into Banlop instead of keeping us out of it. The lot of towheads was troubles we was going to get into with quarrelsome people and all kinds of mean folks. If we minded our business and didn't talk back and aggravate them, we would pull through and get out of the fog and into the big clear river, which was the free states, and wouldn't have no more trouble. It had clouded up pretty dark just after I'd got on to the raft, but it was clearing up again now. Oh, well, that's all interpreted well enough as far as it goes, Jim, I says. But what does these things stand for? It was the leaves and rubbish on the raft and the smash war. You could see them for straight now. Jim looked at the trash, and then looked at me and back at the trash again. He had got the dream fixed so strong in his head that he couldn't seem to shake it loose and get the facts back into its place again right away. But when he did that the thing straightened around, he looked at me steady without ever smiling, and says, What do they stand for? I gwine to tell you. When I got all war out with work, and we de callin for you, and went to sleep, my heart was moss broke because you was loose, and I didn't care no more what become of me and de wrath. And when I wake up and find you back a jean, all safe and sound, de tears come, and I could to got down on my knees and kiss your foot. I so thankful. And all you was thinking about was how you could make a fool of old Jim with a lie. That truck does trash. And trash is what people is Jack puts dirt on de header day, friends, and makes them ashamed. Then he got up slow and walked to the wigwam, and went in there without saying anything but that. But that was enough. It made me feel so mean, I could almost kiss his foot to get him to take it back. It was fifteen minutes before I could work myself up to go and humble myself to a nigger. But I done it, and I weren't ever sorry for it afterwards, neither. I didn't do him no more mean tricks, and I wouldn't done that one if I had a note it would make him feel that way. Chapter 16 We slept most of all day, and started out at night, a little ways behind a monstrous long raft that was as long going by as a procession. She had for long sweeps at each end, so we judged she carried as many as thirty men, lightly. She had five big wigwams aboard, wide apart, and an open camp fire in the middle, and a tall flag pole at each end. There was a power of style about her. It amounted to something being a raftsman on such a craft as that. We went drifting down into a big bend, and the night clouded up and got hot. The river was very wide, and was walled with solid timber on both sides. You couldn't see a break in it hardly ever, or a light. We talked about Cairo, and wondered whether we would know it when we got to it. I said likely we wouldn't, because I heard say there weren't but about a dozen houses there, and if they didn't happen to have them lit up, how was we going to know we was passing a town? Jim said if the two big rivers joined together there, that would show. But I said maybe we might think we was passing the foot of an island and coming into the same old river again. That disturbed Jim. And me too. So the question was what to do. I said paddle ashore the first time a light showed, and tell them Pap was behind, coming along the trading scow, and was a green hand at the business and wanted to know how far it was to Cairo. Jim thought it was a good idea, so we took a smoke on it and waited. There weren't nothing to do now but to look out sharp for the town, and not pass it without seeing it. He said he'd be mighty sure to see it, 
because he'd be a free man the minute he seen it but if he missed it he'd be in a slave country again and no more show for freedom every little while he jumps up and says does she is but it warn't it was jack old lanterns or lightning bugs so he sat down again and went to watching same as before jim say made him all over trembly and feverish to be so close to freedom well i can tell you it made me all over trembly and feverish too to hear him because i begun to get it through my head that he was most free and who was to blame for it why me i couldn't get that out of my conscience no how nor no way it got to troubling me so i couldn't rest i couldn't stay still in one place it hadn't ever come home to me before what this thing was that i was doing but now it did and it stayed with me and scorched me more and more i tried to make out to myself that i warmed to blame because i didn't run jim off from his rightful owner but it warned no use conscience up and says every time but you know he was running for his freedom and you could a palled ashore and told somebody that was so i couldn't get around that no way that was where it pinched conscience says to me what had poor miss watson done to you that you could see her nigger go off right under your eyes and never say one single word what did that poor old woman do to you that you could treat her so mean why she tried to learn you your book she tried to learn you your manners she tried to be good to you every way she knowed how that's what she done i got to feeling so mean and so miserable i most wish i was dead i fidgeted up and down the raft abusing myself to myself and jim was fidgeting up and down past me we neither of us could keep still every time he danced around and says does cairo it went through me like a shot and i thought if it was cairo i reckoned i would die of miserableness jim talked out loud all the time while i was talking to myself he was saying how the first thing he would do when he got to a free state he would go to saving up money and never spend a single cent and when he got enough he would buy his wife which was owned on a farm close to where miss watson lived and then they would both work to buy the two children and if their master wouldn't sell them they'd get an abolitionist to go and steal them it most froze me to hear such talk he wouldn't ever dared to talk such talk in his life before just see what a difference it made in him the minute he judged he was about free it was according to the old saying give a nigger an inch and he'll take an l thinks i this is what comes of my not thinking here was this nigger which i had as good as helped to run away coming right out flat-footed and saying he would steal his children children that belonged to a man i didn't even know a man that hadn't ever done me no harm i was sorry to hear jim say that it was such a lowering of him my conscience got to stirring me up hotter than ever until at last i says to it let up on me it ain't too late yet i'll paddle ashore at the first light and tell i felt easy and happy and light as a feather right off all my troubles was gone i went to looking out sharp for a light and sort of singing to myself hiding by one show jim sings out we safe huck we safe jump up and crack yo heels ats de good old cairo at last i jeez knows it i says i'll take the canoe and go and see jim it mightn't be you know he jumped and got the canoe ready and put his old coat in the bottom for me to set on and give me the paddle and as i shove off he says pooty sue i'll be shoutin for joy and i'll say it's all on account o huck i's a free man ben i couldn't ever been free if it hadn't been for huck huck done it jim won't ever forge it you huck use de bees friend jim's ever had and use de only friend old jim's got now i was paddling off all in a sweat to tell on him but when he says this it seemed to kind of take the tuck all out of me 
I went along slow then, and I warn't right down certain whether I was glad I started or whether I warn't. When I was fifty yards off, Jim says, Bed you goes, de old true hawk, de ony white gentleman dat ever kept his promise to old Jim. Well, I just felt sick, but I says, I'd got to do it. I can't get out of it. Right, then along comes a skiff with two men in it with guns, and they stopped and I stopped. One of them says, What's that yonder? A piece of a raft, I says. Do you belong on it? Yes, sir. Any men on it? Only one, sir. Well, there's five niggers run off two night up yonder above the head of the bend. Is your man white or black? I didn't answer a prompt. I tried to, but the words wouldn't come. I tried for a second or two to brace up and out with it, but I warned man enough. Hadn't the spunk of a rabbit. I see I was weakening. So I just give up trying, and up and says, He's white. I reckon we'll go and see for ourselves. I wish you would, says I, because it's Pat that's bare, and maybe you help me to the raft ashore where the light is. He's sick, and so is Mom and Mary Ann. Oh, the devil! We're in a hurry, boy. But I suppose we've got to. Come, buckle to your paddle, and let's get along. I buckled to my paddle, and they laid to their oars. When we had made a stroke or two, I says, Cap will be mighty much obliged to you, I can tell you. Everybody goes away when I want them to help me to the raft ashore, and I can't do it by myself. Well, that's infernal mean. Bob, too. Say, boy, what's the matter with your father? It's thin. Eh? Thin. Well, it ain't anything much. They stopped pulling. It warned but a mighty little ways to the raft now. One says, Boy, that's a lie. What is the matter with your pap? Answer up square now, and it'll be the better for you. I will, sir, I will, honest. But don't leave us, please. It's bid. Bid. Gentlemen, if you'll only pull ahead and let me heave you the headline, you won't have to come in near the raft. Please do. Set her back, John, set her back, says one. They backed water. Keep away, boy. Keep to lure. Confound it. I just expect the wing has blowed it to us. Your pack's got the smallpox, and you know it precious well. Why didn't you come out and say so? Do you want to spread it all over? Well, says I, a blubbering, I've told everybody before, and they just went away and left us. Poor devil, there's something in that. We are right and sorry for you, but we. Well, hang it, we don't want the smallpox, you see. Look here, I'll tell you what to do. Don't you try to land by yourself, or you'll smash everything to pieces. You float along down about twenty miles, and you'll come to a town on the left-hand side of the river. It will be long after sun up then, and when you ask for help you tell them your folks are all down with chills and fever. Don't be a fool again, and let people guess what is the matter. Now we are trying to do you a kindness. So you just put twenty miles between us. That's a good boy. It wouldn't do any good to land yonder where the light is. It's only a wood yard. Say, I reckon your father's poor, and I'm bound to say he's in pretty hard luck. Here, I'll put a twenty-dollar gold piece on this board, and you get it when it floats by. I feel mighty mean to leave you. But my kingdom, it won't do to fool with smallpox, don't you see? Hold on, Parker, says the other man. Here's a twenty-two put on the board for me. Goodbye, boy. You do as Mr. Parker told you, and you'll be all right. That's so, my boy. Goodbye, goodbye. If you see any runaway niggers, you get help and nab them, 
and you can make some money by it. Goodbye, sir, says I. I won't let no runaway niggers that by me if I can help it. They went off and I got aboard the raft, feeling bad and low, because I knowed very well I had done wrong, and I see it warn't no use for me to try to learn to do right. A body that don't get started right when he's little ain't got no show. When the pinch comes there ain't nothing to back him up and keep him to his work, and so he gets beat. Then I thought a minute, and says to myself, hold on. Suppose you'd had done right and gave Jim up. Would you felt better than what you do now? No, says I, I'd feel bad. I'd feel just the same way I do now. Well, then, says I, what's the use you learning to do right when it's troublesome to do right and ain't no trouble to do wrong? And the way it is is just the same? I was stuck. I couldn't answer that. So I reckoned I wouldn't bother no more about it, but after this always do whichever come handiest at the time. I went into the wigwam. Jim weren't there. I looked all around. He weren't anywhere. I says, Jim, here I is, Huck. His day out outside it. Don't talk loud. He was in the river under the stern, or with just his nose out. I told him they were out of sight, so he come aboard. He says, I was a-listening to all de talk, and I slips into de river and was gwine to shoe for shoe if day come aboard. Then I was gwine to swim to de raffajine when day was gone. But lossy, how you did fool them, Puck? Dat was de smart's dodge. I tell you, Chilly, I speck it save old Jim. Old Jim ain't going to forget you for dat, honey. Then we talked about the money. It was a pretty good raise. Twenty dollars apiece. Jim said we could take deck passage on a steamboat now, and the money would last us as far as we wanted to go in the free states. He said twenty mile more weren't far for the raft to go, but he wished we was already there. Towards daybreak we tied up, and Jim was mighty particular about hiding the raft good. Then he worked all day fixing things in bundles and getting all ready to quit rafting. At night, about ten, we hove in sight of the lights of a town away down in a left-hand bend. I went off in the canoe to ask about it. Pretty soon I found a man out in the river with a skiff, setting a trot line. I arranged up and says, Mister, is that town Cairo? Cairo. No. You must be a blame fool. What town is it, mister? If you want to know, go and find out. If you stay here bothering around me for about a half a minute longer, you'll get something you won't want. I paddled to a raft. Jim was awful disappointed, but I said never mind. Cairo would be the next place, I reckoned. We passed another town before daylight, and I was going out again but it was high ground, so I didn't go. No high ground about Cairo, Jim said. I head for about it. We laid up for the day on a towhead, tolerable close to the left-hand bank. I begun to suspicion something. So did Jim. I says, Maybe we went by Cairo in the fog that night. He says, Don't let's talk about it, Huck. Co niggers can't have no luck. I all expected deck rattlesnake skin weren't done with its work. I wish I'd never seen that snake skin Jim. I do wish I'd never laid eyes on it. It ain't your fault, Puck. You did now. Don't you blame yourself about it. When it was daylight, here was the clear Ohio water in shore, sure enough, and outside was the old regular muddy. So it was all up with Cairo. We topped it all over. It wouldn't do to take to the shore. We couldn't take the raft up the stream, of course. There warn't no way but to wait for dark and start back in the canoe and take the chances. So we slept all day amongst the cottonwood thicket, so as to be freshed for the work. And when we went back to the raft about dark, the canoe was gone. 
We didn't say a word for a good while. There weren't anything to say. We both knowed well enough it was some more work of the rattlesnake skin. So what was the use to talk about it? It would only look like we was finding fault, and that would be bound to fetch more bad luck, and keep on fetching it, too, till we knowed enough to keep still. I and by we talked about what we better do, and found there weren't no way but just to go along down with the raft till we got a chance to buy a canoe to go back in. We weren't going to borrow it when there weren't anybody around the way Pack would do, for that might set people after us. So we shove out after dark on the raft. Anybody of it don't believe yet at its foolishness to handle a snakeskin after all that that snakeskin done for us will believe it now if they read on and see what more had done for us. The place to buy canoes is off of rafts laying up at shore, but we didn't see no rafts laying up, so we went along during three hours and more. Well, the night got gray and rather thick, which is the next meanest thing to fog. You can't tell the shape of the river, and you can't see no distance. It got to be very late and still, and then along comes a steamboat up the river. We lit the lantern and judge she would see it. Upstream boats didn't generally come close to us. They go out and follow the bars and hunt for easy water under the reefs. At night's light, this they bull right up the channel against the whole river. We could hear her pounding along, but we didn't see her good till she was close. She aimed right for us. Often they do that and try to see how close they can come without touching. Sometimes the wheel bites off a sweep, and then the pilot sticks his head out and laughs, and thinks he's mighty smart. Well, here she comes, and we said she was going to try and shave us. But she didn't seem to be shearing off a bit. She was a big one, and she was coming in a hurry, too, looking like a black cloud with rows of glowworms around it. But all of a sudden she bulged out, big and scary, with a long row of wide open furnace doors shining like red hot teeth, and her monstrous bows and guards hanging right over us. There was a yell at us, and a jingling of bells to stop the engines, a powwow of cussing and whistling of steam. And as Jim went overboard on one side and I on the other, she comes smashing straight through the raft. I dived, and I aimed to find the bottom too for a thirty-foot wheel had got to go over me, and I wanted it to have plenty of room. I could always stay under water a minute. This time I reckon I stayed under a minute and a half. Then I bounced for the top in a hurry, for I was nearly busting. I popped out to my armpits and blowed the water out of my nose and puffed a bit. Of course, there was a booming current, and of course, that boat started her engines again ten seconds after she stopped them, for they never cared much for raftsmen. So now she was churning along up the river, out of sight in the thick weather, though I could hear her. I sent out for Jim about a dozen times, but I didn't get any answer. So I grabbed the plank that touched me while I was treading water, and struck out for shore, shoving it ahead of me. But I made out to see that the drift of the current was towards the left-hand shore, which meant that I was in a crossing. So I changed off and went that way. It was one of these long, slanting, two-mile crossings. So I was a good long time in getting over. I made a safe landing and clumb up the bank. I couldn't see but a little ways, but I went poking along over rough ground for a quarter of a mile or more, and then I run across a babe old-fashioned double law house before I noticed it. I was going to rush by and get away, but a lot of dogs jumped out and went to howling and barking at me, and I knowed better than to move another peg. Chapter 17 In about a minute somebody spoke out of a window without putting his head out, and says, Be done, boys. Who's bear? I says, it's me. Who's me? George Jackson, sir. What do you want? 
I don't want nothing, sir. I only want to go along by, but the doves won't let me. What are you prowling around here this time of night for? Eh? I weren't prowling around, sir. I fell overboard off of the steamboat. Oh, he did, did you? Strike a light there, somebody. What did you say your name was? George Jackson, sir. I'm only a boy. Look here, if you are telling the truth, you needn't be afraid. Nobody'll hurt you. But don't try to budge. Stand right where you are. Rouse out Bob and Tom, some of you, and fetch the guns. George Jackson, is there anybody with you? No, sir, nobody. I heard the people stirring around in the house now, and see a light. The man sung out. Snatch that light away. Betsy, you old fool. Ain't you got any sense? Put it on the floor behind the front door. Bob, if you and Tom are ready, take your places. All ready. Now, George Jackson, do you know the Shepherdsons? No, sir. I never heard of them. Well, that may be so, and it mayn't. Now, all ready. Step forward, George Jackson. And mind, don't you hurry. Come mighty slow. If there's anybody with you, let him keep back. If he shows himself, he'll be shot. Come along now. Come slow. Push the door open yourself. Just enough to squeeze in, do you hear? I didn't hurry. I couldn't if I'd a wanted to. I took one slow step at a time, and there weren't a sound. Only I thought I could hear my heart. The dogs were as still as the humans, but they followed a little behind me. When I got to the three log doorsteps, I heard them unlocking and unbarring and unbolting. I put my hand on the door and pushed it a little and a little more till somebody said, There, that's enough. Put your head in. I done it, but I judged they would take it off. The candle was on the floor, and there they all was, looking at me and me at them. For about a quarter of a minute, three big men with buns pointed at me, which made me wince, I tell you, the oldest, gray, and about sixty, the other two thirty or more, all of them fine and handsome, and the sweetest old gray-headed lady, and back of her two young women which I couldn't see right well. The old gentleman says, There, I reckon it's all right. Come in. As soon as I was in the old gentleman, he locked the door and barred it and bolted it, and told the young men to come in with their guns, and they all went in a big parlor that had a new rag carpet on the floor, and got together in a corner that was out of the range of the front windows. There weren't none on the side. They held the candle, and took a good look at me, and all said, Why, he ain't a shepherdson. No, there ain't any shepherdson about him. Then the old man say he hoped I wouldn't mind being searched for arms, because he didn't mean no harm by it. It was only to make sure. So he didn't pry into my pockets, but only felt outside with his hands, and said it was all right. He told me to make myself easy and at home, and tell all about myself. But, the old lady says, Why, bless you, Saul, the poor thing's as wet as he can be. And don't you reckon it may be he's hungry? True for you, Rachel. I forgot. So the old lady says, Betsy, this was a nigger woman. You fly around and get him something to eat as quick as you can, poor thing. And one of you girls go and wake up Buck and tell him, Oh, here he is himself. Buck, take this little stranger and get the wet clothes off from him and dress him up in some of yours that's dry. Buck looked about as old as me. Thirteen or fourteen or along there, though he was a little bigger than me. He hadn't done anything but a shirt, and he was very frowsy-headed. He came in gaping and digging one fist into his eyes, and he was dragging a gun along with the other one. He says, Ain't they no shepherdsons around? They said, No, 
"'Twas a false alarm. Well, he says if they had been some, I reckon I'd a got one. They all laughed, and Bob says, Why, Buck, they might have scalped us all. You've been so slow in coming. Well, nobody come after me, and it ain't right I'm always kept down. I don't get no show. Never mind, Buck, my boy, says the old man. You'll have show enough all in good time. Don't you fret about that. Go along with you now, and do as your mother told you. When we got upstairs to his room, he got me a coarse shirt, band a roundabout and pants of his, and I put them on. While I was at it, he asked me what my name was, but before I could tell him, he started to tell me about a blue jay and a young rabbit he had catched in the woods day before yesterday, and he asked me where Moses was when the candle went out. I said I didn't know. I hadn't heard about it before, no way. Well, Pest, he says. How am I going to guess, says I, when I never heard tell of it before? But you can guess, can't you? It's just as easy. Which candle? I says. Why, any candle, he says. I don't know where he was, says I. Where was he? Why, he was in the dark. That's where he was. Well, if you knowed where he was, what did you ask me for? Why, blame it. It's a riddle. Don't you see? Said, eh, how long are you going to stay here? You got to stay always. We can just have booming times. They don't have no school now. Do you own a dog? I've got a dog. And he'll go in the river and bring out chicks that you throw in. Do you like to comb up Sundays? and all that kind of foolishness. You bet I don't, but ma she makes me. Confound these old britches. I reckon I'd better put them on, but I'd ruther not. It's so warm. Are you all ready? All right. Come along, old hoss. Cold corn quan, cold corn beef, butter and buttermilk. That is what they had for me down there and there ain't nothing better that ever I've come across yet. Buck and his ma and all of them smoked cop pipes, except the niver woman, which was gone, and the two young women. They all smoked and talked, and I eat and talked. The young women had quilts around them, and their hair down their backs. They all asked me questions, and I told them how Pap and me and all the family was living on a little farm down at the bottom of Arkansas and my sister Marion run off and got married and never was heard of no more and bill went to hunt them and he warn't heard of no more and tom and moore died and then there warn't nobody but just me and pap left and he was just trimmed down to nothing on account of his troubles so when he died i took what there was left because the farm didn't belong to us and started up the river deck passage and fell overboard and that was how i come to be here so they said I could have a home there as long as I wanted it. Then it was most daylight and everybody went to bed. And I went to bed with Buck. And when I wake up in the morning, drat it all, I had forgot what my name was. So I lay there about an hour trying to think. And when Buck wake up, I says, Can you spell a buck? Yes, he says. I bet you can't spell my name, says I. I bet you what you dare I can't, says he. All right, says I, go ahead. George Jeff and there now, he says. Well, it says I, you done it, but I didn't think you could. It ain't no slouch of a name to spell. Right off without study. I set it down, private, because somebody might want me to spell it next, and so I'd want it to be handy with it and rattle it off like I was used to it. It was a mighty nice family, and a mighty nice house, too. I hadn't seen no house out in the country before that was so nice, and had so much style. It didn't have an iron latch on the front door, nor a wooden one with a buckskin string, but a brass knob to churn, the same as houses in town. There weren't no bed in the parlor, nor a sign of a bed. 
but heaps of parlors in towns has beds in them. There was a big fireplace at was bricked on the bottom, and the bricks was kept clean and red by pouring water on them and scrubbing them with another brick. Sometimes they wash them over with red water paint that they call Spanish brown, same as they do in town. They had big brass dog irons that could hold up a saw log. There was a clock on the middle of the mantelpiece, with a picture of a town painted on the bottom half of the glass front, and a round place in the middle of it for the sun, and you could see the pendulum swinging behind it. It was beautiful to hear that clock tick, and sometimes, when one of these peddlers had been along and scoured her up and got her in good shape, she would start in and strike a hundred and fifty before she got tuckered out. They wouldn't took any money for her. Well, there was a big outlandish parrot on each side of the clock, made out of something like chalk, and painted up gaudy. By one of the parrots was a cat made of crockery, and a crockery dog by the other. And when you pressed down on them, they squeaked, but didn't open their mouths, nor look different, nor interested. They squeaked through underneath. There was a couple of big wild turkey wind fans spread out behind those fins. On the table in the middle of the room was a kind of a lovely crockery basket that had apples and oranges and peaches and grapes piled up in it, which was much redder and yellower and prettier than real ones is. But they weren't real because you could see where pieces had got chipped off and showed the white chalk, or whatever it was, underneath. This table had a cover made out of beautiful oilcloth, with a red and blue spread eagle painted on it, and a painted border all around. It come all the way from Philadelphia, they said. There was some books, too, piled up perfectly exact on each corner of the table. One was a big family Bible full of pictures. One was Pilgrim's Progress, about a man that left his family it didn't say why. I read considerable in it now and then. The statements was interesting, but tough. Another was Friendship's Offering, full of beautiful stuff and poetry. But I didn't read the poetry. Another was Henry Clay's Speeches, and another was Dr. Bunn's Family Medicine, which told you all about what to do if a body was sick or dead. There was a hymn book and a lot of other books. And there was nice split-bottom chairs, and perfectly sound, too. Not bagged, down in the middle and busted, like an old basket. They had pictures hung on the walls. Mainly Washington's and Lafayette's, and Battles, and Highland the Mary's, and one called Signing the Declaration. There was some that they called crayons, which one of the daughters which was dead made her own self when she was only fifteen years old. They was differed from any pictures I ever see before, blacker, mostly, than is common. One was a woman in a slim black dress, belted small under the armpits, with bulges like a cabbage in the middle of the sleeves, and a large black spook shovel bonnet with a black veil, and white slim ankles crossed about with black tape, and very wee black slippers, like a chisel, and she was leaning pensive on a tombstone on her right elbow, under a weeping willow, and her other hand hanging down her side holding a white handkerchief and a reticule, and underneath the picture it said, Shall I never see thee more, alas? Another one was a young lady with her hair all combed up straight to the top of her head, and knotted there in front of a comb like a chair back, and she was crying into a handkerchief, and had a dead bird laying on its back in her other hand with its heels up, and underneath the picture it said, I shall never hear thy sweet chirrup more alas. There was one where a young lady was at a window looking up at the moon, and tears running down her cheeks, and she had an open letter in one hand with black sealing wax showing on one edge of it, and she was mashing a locket with a chain to it against her mouth, and underneath the picture it said, And art thou gone, yes, thou art gone, alas. These was all nice pictures, I reckon, but I didn't somehow seem to take to them, because if ever I was down a little, they always give me the phantoms. Everybody was sorry she died, because she had laid out a lot more of these pictures to do, 
and a by could see by what she had done what they had lost but i reckon that with her disposition she was having a better time in the graveyard she was at work on what they said was her greatest picture when she took sick and every day and every night it was her prayer to be allowed to live till she got it done but she never got the chance it was a picture of a young woman in a long white gown standing on the rail of a bridge all ready to jump off with her hair all down her back and looking up to the moon with the tears running down her face and she had two arms folded across her breast and two arms stretched out in front and two more reaching up towards the moon and the idea was to see which pair would look best and then scratch out all the other arms but as i was saying she died before she got her mind made up and now they kept this picture over the head of the bed in her room and every time her birthday come they hung flowers on it other times it was hid with a little curtain the young woman in the picture had a kind of a nice sweet face but there were so many arms it made her look to sputtery seemed to me this young girl kept a scrapbook when she was alive and used to paste obituaries and accidents and cases of patient suffering in it out of the presbyterian observer and write poetry after them out of her own head it was very good poetry this is what she wrote about a boy by the name of stephen dowlingbots that fell down a well and was drowned ode to stephen dowlingbots decked and did young stephen sicken and did young stephen die and did this sad hearts thicken and did the mourners cry no such was not the fate of young stephen dowlingbots both sad hearts round him thickened that was not from sickness shops no whooping cough did rack his frame nor measles rear with spots not these impaired the sacred name of stephen dowling bots despise love struck not with woe that head of curly knots nor stomach troubles laid him low young stephen dowling bots oh no then list with tearful eye whilst i his fate do tell his soul did from this cold world fly by falling down a well they got him out and emptied him alas it was too late his spirit was gone for to sport aloft in the realms of the good and great if emmeline grangerford could make poetry like that before she was fourteen there ain't no telling what she could a done by and by buck said she could rattle off poetry like nothing she didn't ever have to stop to fake he said she would slap down a line and if she couldn't find anything to rhyme with it would just scratch it out and slap down another one and go ahead she warned particular she could write about anything you choose to give her to write about just so it was sappho every time a man died or a woman died or a child died she would be on hand with her tribute before he was cold she called them tributes the neighbors said it was the doctor first then emmeline then the undertaker the undertaker never got in ahead of emmeline but once and then she hung fire on a rhyme for the dead person's name which was whistler she warned ever the same after that she never complained but she kinder pined away and did not live long poor thing many's the time i made myself go up to the little room that used to be hers and get out her poor old scrapbook and rate in it when her pictures had been aggravating me and i had soured on her a little i liked all but family dead ones and all and warned going to let anything come between us poor emmeline made coterie about all the dead people when she was alive and it didn't seem right that there weren't nobody to make some about her now she was gone so i tried to sweat out a verse or two myself but i couldn't seem to make it go somehow they kept emmeline's room trim and nice and all the things fixed in it just the way she liked to have them when she was alive and nobody ever slept there the old lady took care of the room herself though there was plenty of niggers and she sewed there a good deal and read her bible there mostly well as i was saying about the parlor there was beautiful curtains on the windows white with pictures painted on them of castles with vines all down the walls 
and cattle coming down to drink. There was a little old piano, too, that had tin pans in it, I reckon, and nothing was ever so lovely as to hear the young ladies sing the last lane is broken and play the Battle of Prague on it. The walls of all the rooms was plastered, and most had carpets on the floors, and the whole house was whitewashed on the outside. It was a double house, and the big open place betwixt them was roofed and floored, and sometimes the table was set there in the middle of the day, and it was a cool, comfortable place. Nothing couldn't be better, and warmed the cooking good, and just bushels of it, too. Chapter 18 Colonel Brangerford was a gentleman, you see. He was a gentleman all over, and so was his family. He was well-born, as the saying is, and that's worth as much in a man as it is in a horse, so the widow Douglas said, and nobody ever denied that she was of the first aristocracy in our town. And Pap, he always said it, too, though he warn't no more quality than a muck hat himself. Colonel. Grangerford was very tall and very slim, and had a darkish pale complexion, not a sign of red in it anywheres. He was clean shaved every morning all over his thin face, and he had the thinnest kind of lips, and the thinnest kind of nostrils, and a high nose, and heavy eyebrows, and the blackest kind of eyes, sunk so deep back that they seemed like they was looking out of caverns at you, as you may say. His forehead was high, and his hair was black and straight and hung to his shoulders. His hands was long and thin, and every day of his life he put on a clean shirt and a full suit from head to foot made out of linen so white it hurt for eyes to look at it. And on Sundays he wore a blue tail coat with brass buttons on it. He carried a mahogany cane with a silver head to it. There weren't no frivolishness about him, not a bit, and he weren't ever loud. He was as kind as he could be. You could feel that, you know, and so you had confidence. Sometimes he smiled, and it was good to see. But when he straightened himself up like a liberty pole, and the lightning begun to flicker out from under his eyebrows, you wanted to climb a tree first, and find out what the matter was afterwards. He didn't ever have to tell anybody to mind their manners. Everybody was always good-mannered where he was. Everybody loved to have him around, too. He was sunshine most always. I mean, he made it seem like good weather. When he turned into a cloud bank, it was awful dark for half a minute, and that was enough. There wouldn't nothing go wrong again for a week. When him and the old lady come down in the morning, all the family got up out of their chairs and give him good day, and didn't sit down again till they had sat down. Then Tom and Bob went to the sideboard where the decanter was, and mixed a glass of bitters and handed it to him, and he held it in his hand and waited till Tom's and Bob's was mixed, and then they bowed and said, Our duty to you, sir, and Nanum. And they bowed the least bit in the world and said, Thank you, and so they drank all three, and Bob and Tom poured a spoonful of water on the sugar and the mite of whiskey, or apple brandy in the bottom of their tumblers, and give it to me and Buck, and we drank to the old people too. Bob was the oldest and Tom next. Tall, beautiful men with very broad shoulders and brown faces, and long black hair and black eyes. They dressed in white linen from head to foot, like the old gentleman, and wore broad Panama hats. Then there was Miss Charlotte. She was twenty-five, and tall and proud and grand, but as good as she could be when she warned stirred up. But when she was, she had a look that would make you wilt in your tracks, like her father. She was beautiful. So was her sister, Miss Sophia, but it was a different kind. She was gentle and sweet like a dove, and she was only twenty. Each person had their own nigger to wait on them. Buck, too. My nair had a monstrous easy time, because I weren't used to having anybody do anything for me, but Bucks was on the jump most of the time. This was all there was of the family now, but there used to be more. Three sons. They got killed. 
and Emmeline that died. The old gentleman owned a lot of farms and over a hundred niggers. Sometimes a stack of people would come there, coursed back from ten or fifteen mile round, and stay five or six days, and have such junketings round about and on the river, and dances and picnics in the woods daytimes, and balls at the house nights. These people was mostly kinfolks of the family. The men brought their guns with them. It was a handsome lot of quality, I tell you. There was another clan of aristocracy ran bare. Five or six families, mostly of the name of Shepherdson. They was as high-toned and well-born and rich and grand as the tribe of Grangerfords. The Shepherdsons and Grangerfords used the same steamboat landing, which was about two mile above our house. So sometimes... When I went up there with a lot of our folks, I used to see a lie the Shepherdsons there on their fine horses. One day Buck and me was away out in the woods hunting and heard a horse coming. We was crossing the road. Buck says, Quick, jump for the woods. We died and then peeped down the woods through the leaves. Pretty soon a splendid young man come galloping down the road setting his horse easy and looking like a soldier he had his gun across his pommel i had seen him before it was young harney shepherdson i heard buck's gun go off at my ear and harney's hat tumbled off from his head he grabbed his gun and rode straight to the place where we was hid but we didn't wait we started through the woods on a run the woods weren't thick so I looked over my shoulder to dodge the bullet, and twice I seen Harney cover Buck with his gun, and then he rode away the way he come. To get his hat I reckon, but I couldn't see. We never stopped running till we got home. The old gentleman's eyes blazed a minute. T'was pleasure, mainly, I judged. Then his face sort of smoothed down, and he says, kind of gentle, I don't like it shooting from behind a bush. Why didn't you step into the road, my boy? The Shepherdsons don't, father. They always take advantage. Miss Charlotte, she held her head up like a queen while Buck was telling his tale, and her nostrils spread and her eyes snapped. The two young men looked dark, but never said nothing. Miss Sophia, she turned pale but the color come back when she found the man warned hurt. Soon as I could get Buck down by the corn cribs under the trees by ourselves, I says, Did you want to kill him, Buck? Well, I bet I did. What did he do to you? Kin, he never done nothing to me. Well, then, what did you want to kill him for? Why, nothing. Only it's on account of the feud. What's a feud? Why, where was you raised? Don't you know what a feud is? Never heard of it before. Tell me about it. Well, says Buck, a feud is this way. A man has a quarrel with another man and kills him. Then, that other man's brother kills him. Then, the other brothers on both sides goes for one another. Then, the cousins chip in and by and by everybody's killed off, and there ain't no more feud. But it's kind of slow, and takes a long time. Has this one been going on long, Uck? Uh? Well, I should reckon. It started thirty year ago, or summers along there. There was trouble about something, and then a lawsuit to settle it. And the suit went to Jean, one of the men, and so he up and shut the man, that won the suit, which he would naturally do, of course. Anybody would. What was the trouble about, Buck? Land. I reckon maybe. I don't know. Well, who done the shooting? Was it a Granger for it or a Shepherd's? Loss, how do I know? It was so long ago. Don't anybody know? Oh, yes. Pa knows, I reckon, and some of the other old people. But they don't know now what the row was about in the first place. As there have been many killed, Uck. 
yes right smart chance of funerals but they don't always kill pa's bought a few buckshot in him but he don't mind it cursed he don't weigh much anyway bob's been carved up some with a bowie and tom's been hurt once or twice has anybody been killed this year buck yes we got one and they got one about three months ago my cousin bud fourteen year old was riding through the woods on t'other side of the river and didn't have no weapon with him which was blame foolishness and in a lonesome place he hears a horse a coming behind him and sees old baldy shepherdson a lincoln after him with his bun in his hand and his white hair a flying in the wind instead of jumping off and taking to the brush bud loud he could outrun him so they had it nick and tuck for five mile or more the old man gaining all the time so at last bud seen it warn't any use so he sopped and faced around so as to have the bullet holes in front you know and the old man he rode up and shot him down but he didn't get much chance to enjoy his luck for inside of a week our folks laid him out i reckon that old man was a coward buck i reckon he warn't a coward not by a blame sight there ain't a coward amongst them shepherdsons not a one and there ain't no cowards amongst the grangerfords either why that old man kept up his end in a fight one day for half an hour against three grangerfords and come out winner they was all a horseback he lit off of his horse and got behind a little wood pile and kept his horse before him to stop the bullets but the grangerfords stayed on their horses and capered around the old man and peppered away at him and he peppered away at them him and his horse both went home pricky and leaky and crippled but the grangerfords had to be fetched home and one of em was dead and another died the next day no sir if the bodies are hunting for cowards he don't want to fool away any time amongst them shepherdsons because they don't breed any of that kind next sunday we all went to church about three mile everybody a horseback the men took their guns along so did buck and kept them between their knees or stood them handy against the wall the shepherdsons done the same it was pretty ornery preaching all about brotherly love and such like tiresome in us. but everybody said it was a good sermon and they all talked it over going home and had such a powerful lot to say about faith and good works and free grace and preferred destination and i don't know what all that it did seem to me to be one of the roughest sundays i had run across yet about an hour after dinner everybody was dozing around some in their chairs and some in their rooms and it got to be pretty dull buck and a dog was stretched out on the grass in the sun sound asleep i went up to our room and judged i would take a nap myself i found that sweet miss sophia standing in her door which was next two hours and she took me in her room and shut the door very soft and asked me if i liked her and i said i did and she asked me if i would do something for her and not tell anybody and i said i would then she said she'd forgot her testament and left it in the seat at church between two other books and would i slip out quiet and go there and fetch it to her and not say nothing to nobody i said i would so i slid out and slipped off up the road and there warn't anybody at the church except maybe a hog or two for there warn't any lock on the door and hogs likes a punch and floor in summer time because it's cool if you notice most folks don't go to church only when they've got to but a hog is different says i to myself something's up it ain't natural for a girl to be in such a sweat about a testament so i give it a shake and out drops a little piece of paper with half past to wrote on it with a pencil i ransacked it but couldn't find anything else i couldn't make anything out of that so i put the paper in the book again and when i got home and upstairs there was miss sophia in her door waiting for me she pulled me in and shut the door 
then she looked in the testament till she found the paper and as soon as she read it she looked glad and before a body could think she grabbed me and give me a squeeze and said i was the best boy in the world and not to tell anybody she was mighty red in the face for a minute and her eyes lighted up and it made her powerful pretty i was a good deal astonished but when i got my breath i asked her what the paper was about and she asked me if i had read it and i said no and she asked me if i could read writing and i told her no only coarse hand and then she said the paper warned anything but a bookmark to keep her place and i might go and play now i went off down to the river studying over this thing and pretty soon i noticed that my nigger was following along behind when we was out of sight of the house he looked back and around a second and then comes a running and says mars george if you come down into de swamp i'll show you a whole stack of water moccasins thinks i that's mighty curious he said that yesterday he otter no a body don't love water moccasins enough to go round hunting for them what is he up to anyway so i says all right trot ahead i followed a half a mile then he struck out over the swamp and waded ankle deep as much as another half mile we come to a little flat piece of land which was dry and very thick with trees and bushes and vines and he says you shove right in dud just a few steps mars dud thus what day is i seed em before i don't care to see em no mo then he slopped right along and went away and pretty soon the trees hid him i poked into the place of maize and come to a little open patch as big as a bedroom all hung around with vines and found a man laying erisly and by jings it was my old jim i waked him up and i reckoned it was going to be a grand surprise to him to see me again but it warn't he nearly cried he was so glad but he warn't surprised said he swum along behind me that night and heard me yell every time but das answer because he didn't want nobody to pick him up and take him into slavery again says he i got hurt a little and couldn't swim fast so i was a considerable ways behind you towards de loss when you landed i reckoned i could catch up with you on de land at heaven to shout at you but when i see dat house i begin to go slow i was off to fur to hear what dey say to you i was freight o de dods but when it was all quiet Jean, i knowed you's in de house so i struck out for de woods to wait for day early in de mon in summer de knitters come along gwine to de fields and dey took me and showed me dis place where de dogs can't track me on account so de water and dey brings me truck to eat every night and tells me how you's it get along why didn't you tell my jack to fetch me here sooner gin well torn no use to sturb you huck tell we could do something but we's all right now i been a buying pots and pans and bittles as i got a chance in a patchin up de raff nights when what raft jim our old raff you mean to say our old raft warn't smash all to flinders no she warn't she was tore up a good deal one end of her was but dey warn't no great harm done on the our trats was moss all loss if we hadn't died so deep and swum so fur under water and de night had been so dark and we warn't so spear and been such pumpkin heads as de sayin is we a seen de raff but it's jees as well we didn't kays now she's all fixed up a jean moss as good as new and we's got a new lot o oh stuff in the place o oh, what us loss why how did you get hold of the raft again jim did you catch her how i gwine to catch her and i out in de woods no some are de niggers found her catch on a snag along he and de ben and de hit her in a prick mongst de willows 
and dey was so much joint bout which anon she blong to de moss dat i come to heed bout it pooty soon so i ups and settles de trouble by tellin um she don't belong to none of um but to you and me and i asked miff dey gwine to grab a young white gentleman's property and get a hidden for it dan i jim ten cent a piece and dey was mighty well satisfied and wished some o rats would come along and make richard jean gaze my good to me dis niggers is and whatever i wants em to do for me i don't have to ask em twice honey dat jack's a good nigger and pooty smart yes he is he ain't ever told me was here told me to come and he'd show me a lot of water moccasins if anything happens he ain't mixed up in it he can say he never seen us together and it'll be the truth i don't want to talk much about the next day i reckon i'll cut it pretty short i waked up about dawn and was a-going to turn over and go to sleep again when i noticed how still it was didn't seem to be anybody stirring that weren't usual next i noticed that bop was up and gone well i gets up the wondering and goes downstairs nobody around everything as still as a mouse just the same outside thinks i what does it mean down by the wood pile i comes across my jack and says what's it all about says he don't you know morris george no says i i don't well den miss sophia's run off deed she has she run off in de night some time nobody don't know jees when run off to get married to dat young harney shepherdson you know leastways so de spec de family found it out bout half an hour ago maybe a little mo and i tell you de warn't no time loss sich another hurryin up guns and hosses you never see de women folks has gone for to stir up de relations and all mars saul and de boys tuck day guns and rode up de river road for to try to catch dat young man and kill him fo he can did across de river wid miss sophia i reckon days gwine to be mighty rough times up went off out waking me up well i reckon he did dey warn gwine to mix you up in it mars buck he loaded up his gun and lo he's gwine to fetch home a shepherdson or bus well dey'll be plenty undot i reckon and you bet you he'll fetch on if he gets a chance i took up the river road as hard as i could put by and by i begin to hear guns a good ways off when i come in sight of the lob store and the whip pile where the steamboats lands i worked along under the trees and brush till i got to a good place and then i clumb up into the forks of a cottonwood that was out of reach and watched there was a wood rank for foot high a little ways in front of the tree and first i was going to hide behind that but maybe it was luckier i didn't there was four or five men cavoring around on their horses in the open place before the lob store cussing and yelling and trying to get at a couple of young chaps that was behind the wood rank alongside of the steamboat landing but they couldn't come it every time one of them showed himself on the river side of the woodpile he got shot at the two boys was squatting back to back behind the pile so they could watch both ways by and by the men stopped cavorting around and yelling they started riding towards the store then up gets one of the boys draws a stay bead over the wood rank and drops one of them out of his saddle all the men jumped off of their horses and grabbed the hurt one and started to carry him to the store and that minute the two boys started on the run they got halfway to the tree i was in before the men noticed then the men see them and jumped on their horses and took out after them they gained on the boys but it didn't do no good the boys had to go a start they got to the wood bough that was in front of my tree and slipped in behind it and so they had the bulge on the men again one of the boys was buck and the other was a slim young chap about nineteen years old 
the men ripped round a while and den rode away as soon as they was out of sight i sung out to buck and told him he didn't know what to make of my voice coming out of the tree at first he was awful surprised he told me to watch out sharp and let him know when the men come in sight again said they was up to some devomit or other wouldn't be gone long i wish i was out of that tree but i dasn't come down up begun to cry and rip and load that him and his cousin joe that was the other young chap would make up for this day yet he said his father and his two brothers was killed and two or three of the enemy said the shepherdsons laid for them in ambush buck said his father and brothers ought to wait it for their relations the shepherdsons was too strong for them i had asked him what was become of young parney and miss sophia he said they got across the river and was safe i was glad of that but the way buck did take on because he didn't manage to kill harney that day he shot at him i hain't ever heard anything like it all of a sudden bam bam man goes three or four guns a men had slipped around through the woods and come in from behind without their horses the boys jump for the river both of them hurt and as they swum down the current the men run along the bank shooting at them and singing out kill them kill them it made me so sick i most fell out of the tree i ain't a going to tell all that happened it would make me sick again if i was to do that i wish i hadn't ever come ashore that night to see such fins i ain't ever going to get shut of them lots of times i dream about them i stayed in the tree till it begun to get dark afraid to come down sometimes i heard vons away off in the woods and twice i seen little gangs of men gallop past the lot store with guns so i reckon the trouble was still going on i was mighty downhearted so i made up my mind i wouldn't ever go in near that house again because i reckoned i was to blame somehow i judged that that piece of paper meant that miss sophia was to meet harney somewheres at half past two and run off and i judged i ought to told her father about that paper and the curious way she acted and then maybe he would a locked her up and this awful mess wouldn't ever happen when i got down out of the tree i crept along down the river bank a piece and found the two bodies laying in the edge of the water and tugged at them till i got them ashore then i covered up their faces and got away as quick as i could i cried a little when i was covering up buck's face for he was mighty good to me it was just dark now i never went near the house but struck through the woods and made for the swamp jim warn on his island so i tramped off in a hurry for the creek and crowded through the willows red hot to jump aboard and get out of that awful country the raft was gone my souls but i was scared i couldn't get my breath for most a minute then i raised a yell a voice not twenty-five foot from me says good lad is that you honey don't make no noise it was jim's voice nothing ever sounded so good before i run along the bank a piece and got aboard and jim he grabbed me and hugged me he was so glad to see me he says laws bless you chilly i as right down shoe you's dead and jean jack's been he he say he reckon you's been shot he's you didn't come home no mo so i's g's dis minute a startin de raft down towards de mulford de creek so's to be all ready for to shove out him leave soon as jack comes the jean and tells me for certain you is dead lossy i's mighty glad to did you back a jean honey i says all right that's mighty good they won't find me and they'll think i've been killed and floated down the river here's something up there that'll help them think so so don't you lose no time jim but just shove off for the bid water as fast as ever you can i never felt easy to
until the raft was two miles below there and out in the middle of the Mississippi. Then we hung up our signal lantern and judged that we was free and safe once more. I hadn't had a bite to eat since yesterday, so Jim he got out some corn dodgers and buttermilk and pork and cabbage and greens. There ain't nothing in the world so good when it's cooked right. And whilst I eat my supper, we talk and had a good time. I was powerful glad to get away from the feuds, and so was Jim to get away from the swamp. We said there were no home like a raft, after all. Other places do seem so cramped up and smothery, but a raft don't. You feel mighty free and easy and comfortable on a raft. Chapter 19 Two or three days and nights went by. I reckon I might say they slum by. They slid along so quiet and smooth and lovely. Here is the way we put in the time. It was a monstrous big river down there, sometimes a mile and a half wide. We run nights and laid up and hid daytimes. Soon as night was most gone, we stopped navigating and tied up, nearly always in the dead water under a towhead, and then cut young cottonwoods and willows and hid the raft with them. Then we set out the lines. Next we slid into the river and had a swim so as to freshen up and cool off. Then we sat down on the sandy bottom where the water was about knee-deep and watched the daylight come. Not a sound anywheres. Perfectly still. Just like the whole world was asleep, only sometimes the bullfrogs a cluttering, maybe. The first thing to see Looking away over the water was a kind of dull line. That was the woods on t'other side. You couldn't make nothing else out. Then a pale place in the sky. Then more paleness spreading around. Then the river softened up a way off and weren't black any more but gray. You could see little dark spots drifting along ever so far away, trading scows and such things and long black streaks, rafts. Sometimes you could hear a sweep's creaking, or jumbled up voices, it was so chill, and sounds come so far. And by and by you could see a streak on the water, which you know by the look of the streak, that there's a snant there and a swift current which breaks on it and makes that streak look that way. And you see the mist curl up off of the water, and the east reddens up, and the river and you make out a log cabin in the edge of the woods, away on the bank on t'other side of the river, being a woodyard, lightly, and piled by them cheats so you can throw it all through it anywheres. Then a nice breeze springs up and comes fanning you from over there, so cool and fresh and sweet to smell on account of the woods and the flowers, but sometimes not that way because they've left dead fish laying around, gars and such, and they do get pretty rank. And next you've got the full day, and everything smiling in the sun, and the songbirds just going it. A little smoke couldn't be noticed now, so we would take some fish off of the lines and cook up a hot breakfast. And afterwards we would watch the long ziminus of the river, and kind of lazy along, and by and by lazy off to sleep. Wake up by and by, and look to see what done it, and maybe see a steamboat coughing along upstream, so far off towards the other side you couldn't tell nothing about her, only whether she was a stern wheel or side wheel. Then for about an hour there wouldn't be nothing to hear, nor nothing to see, just solid lonesomeness. Next you'd see a raft sliding by, away off yonder, and maybe a gillet on it chopping, because their moat always doing it on a raft. You'd see the axe flash and come down. You don't hear nothing. You see that axe go up again, and by the time it's above the man's head, then you hear the chunk. It had took all that time to come over the water. So we would put in the day, lazying around, listening to the stillness. Once there was a thick fog, and the rafts and things that went by was beating tin pans, so the steamboats wouldn't run over them. A scow or a raft went by so close we could hear them talking and cussing and laughing, heard them playing. 
but we couldn't see no sign of them it made you feel crawly it was like spirits carrying on that way in the air jim said he believed it was spirits but i says no spirits wouldn't say durn the durn fog soon as it was night out we shoved when we got her out to about the middle we let her alone and let her float wherever the current wanted her to then we lit the pipes and dangled our legs in the water and talked about all kinds of things we was always naked day and night whenever the mosquitoes would let us the new clothes buck's folks made for me was too good to be comfortable and besides i didn't go much on clothes no how sometimes we'd have the whole river all to ourselves for the longest time yonder was the banks and the islands across the water and maybe a spark which was a candle in a cabin window and sometimes on the water you could see a spark or two on a raft or a scow you know and maybe you could hear a fiddle or a song coming over from one of them crafts it's lovely to live on a raft we had the sky up there all speckled with stars and we used to lay on our backs and look up at them and discuss about whether they was made or only just happened jim he allowed they was made but i'd allow they happened i judged it would have took too long to make so many jim said the moon could a laid them well that looked kind of reasonable so i didn't say nothing against it because i've seen a frog lay most as many so of course it could be done we used to watch the stars that fell too and see them streak down jim allowed they'd got spoiled and was hove out of the nest once or twice of a night we would see a steamboat slipping along in the dark and now and then she would belch a whole world of sparks up out of her chimbleys and they would rain down in the river and look awful pretty then she would turn a corner and her likes would wink out and her power shut off and leave the river still again and by and by her waves would get to us a long time after she was gone and joggle the raft a bit and after that you wouldn't hear nothing for you couldn't tell how long except maybe frogs or something after midnight the people on shore went to bed and then for two or three hours the shores was black no more sparks in the cabin windows these sparks was our clock the first one that showed again meant morning was coming so we hunted a place to hide and tie up right away one morning about daybreak i found a canoe and crossed over a chute to the main shore it was only two hundred yards and paddled about a mile up a creek amongst the cypress woods to see if i couldn't get some berries just as i was passing a place where a kind of a cow calf crossed the creek here comes a couple of men tearing up the path as tight as they could foot it i thought i was a goner for whenever anybody was after anybody i judged it was me or maybe jim i was about to dig out from there in a hurry but they was pretty close to me then and sung out and begged me to save their lives said they hadn't been doing nothing and was being chased for it said there was men and dogs a coming they wanted to jump right in but i says don't you do it i don't hear the dogs and horses yet you've got time to crowd through the brush and get up the creek a little ways then you take to the water and wade down to me in bedhead that'll throw the dogs off the scent they done it and soon as they was aboard i lit out for our towhead and in about five or ten minutes we heard the dogs and the men away off shouting we heard them come along towards the creek but couldn't see them they seemed to stop and fool around a while then as we got further and further away all the time we couldn't hardly hear them at all by the time we had left a mile of woods behind us and struck the river everything was quiet and we paddled over to the towhead and hid in the cottonwoods and was safe one of these fellows was about seventy or upwards and had a bald head and very gray whiskers he had an old battered up slouch hat on and a greasy blue woolen shirt and ragged old blue jeans breeches stuffed into his boot tocks 
and home knit galooses. No, he only had one. He had an old long-tailed blue jeans coat with slick brass buttons flung over his arm, and both of them had big, fat, ratty-looking carpet bags. The other fellow was about thirty, and dressed about as ornery. After breakfast we all laid off and talked, and the first thing that come out was that these chaps didn't know one another. What got you into trouble? says the bellhead to t'other chat. Well, I'd been selling an article to take the tartar off the teeth, and it does take it off, too, and generally the enamel along with it. But I stayed about one night longer than I ought to, and was just in the act of sliding out when I ran across you on the trail this side of town, and you told me they were coming and begged me to help you to get off. So I told you I was expecting trouble myself, and would scatter out with you. That's the whole yarn. What's yearn? Well, I been a runnin' a little temperance revival thar, bout a week, and was the pet of the women folks, big and little, for I was mackin' it mighty warm for the rumbies, I tell you, and takin' as much as five or six dollars a night. Ten cents a head, children and niggers free, and business a-growin' all the time, when somehow or another a little report I round last night, that I had a way of puttin' in my time with a private jug on the sly. A nigger roosted me out this morning, then told me the people was thetherin' on the quiet with their dogs and horses, and they'd be along pretty soon and give me bout half an hour's start, and then run me down if they could, and if they got me they tar and feather me and ride me on a rail, sure. I didn't wait for no breakfast. I warn't hungry. Old man, said the young one, I reckon we might double-team it together. What do you think? I ain't undisposed. What's your line? Mainly. Jewer printer by trade. Do a little in patent medicines. Theater actor. Tragedy, you know. Take a turn to mesmerism and phrenology when there's a chance. Teach singing geography school for a change. Sling a lecture sometimes. Oh, I do lots of things. Most anything that comes handy, so it ain't work. What's your lay? I've done considerable in the doctoring way in my time. Laying on no hand is my best halt for cancer and paralysis and sich things. And I can tell a fortune pretty good when I've got somebody along to find out the facts from me. Preachin's my line, too, and work in camp meetings and missionary in a round. Nobody never said anything for a while. Then the young man hove a sigh and says, Alas, what are you alassin' about? says the bald head. To think I should have lived to be leading such a life, and be degraded down into such company and he began to wipe the corner of his eye with a rag. "'Turn your skin. Ain't the company good enough for you?' says the bald head, pretty pert and uppish. "'Yes, it is good enough for me. It's as good as I deserve. For who fetched me so low when I was so high? I did myself. I don't blame you, gentlemen. Far from it. I don't blame anybody. I deserve it all.' Let the cold world do its worst. One thing I know. There's a grave somewhere for me. The world may go on just as it's always done, and take everything from me. Loved ones, property, everything. But it can't take that. Some day I'll lie down in it and forget it all, and my poor broken heart will be at rest. He went on a wiping. Drot your poor broken heart says the bald head. What are you heaving your poor broken heart at us for? We hain't done nothing. No, I know you haven't. I ain't blaming you, gentlemen. I brought myself down. Yes, I did it myself. It's right I should suffer. Perfectly right. I don't make any moan. Brought you down from war. War was you brought down from. Ah, you would not believe me. The world never believes. Let it pass. Tis no matter. 
the secret of my birth the secret of your birth do you mean to say gentlemen said the young man very solemn i will reveal it to you for i fee i may have confidence in you by rights i am a duke Jim's eyes bowed out when he heard that, and I reckon mine did, too. Then the bald head says, No, you can't mean it. Yes, my great-grandfather, eldest son of the Duke of Bridgewater, fled to this country about the end of the last century to breathe the pure air of freedom, married here, and died, leaving a son, his own father dying about the same time the second son of the late duke seized the titles and estates the infant real duke was ignored i am the lineal descendant of that infant i am the rightful duke of bridgewater and here am i forlorn torn from my high estate hunted of men despised by the cold world ragged worn heartbroken and degraded to the companionship of felons on a raft jim pitied him ever so much and so did i we tried to comfort him but he said it warn't much use he couldn't be much comforted said if we was a mind to acknowledge him that would do him more good than most anything else so we said we would if he would tell us how he said we ought to bow when we spoke to him and say your grace or my lord or your lordship and he wouldn't mind it if we called him plain bridgewater which he said was a title anyway and not a name and one of us ought to wait on him at dinner and do any little thing for him he wanted done well that was all easy so we done it all through dinner jim stood around and waited on him and says will yo brace have some bo dist or some o dat and so on and a body could see it was mighty pleasing to him but the old man got pretty silent by and by didn't have much to say and didn't look pretty comfortable over all that petting that was going on around that dupe he seemed to have something on his mind so along in the afternoon he says looky he here bilged water he says i'm nation sorry for you but you ain't the only person that's had troubles like that no no you ain't you ain't the only person that's been snaked down wrongfully out in a high place alas no you ain't the only person that's had a secret of his birth and by jings he begins to cry hold what do you mean bilgewater can i trust you says the old man still sort of sobbing it's the bitter death he took the old man by the hand and squeezed it and says that secret of your being speak Bildwater, I am the late Dauphin. You bet you, Jim and me stared this time. Then the Duke says, You are what? Yes, my friend, these too true. Your eyes is looking at this very moment on the poor disappeared Dauphin, Louis the Seventeen, son of Louis the Sixteen and Mary Antoinette. You, at your age, no, you mean you are the late Charlemagne. You must be six or seven hundred years old, at the very least. Trouble has done it, Bilchwater. Trouble has done it. Trouble has brung these gray hairs and this premature balditude. Yes, gentlemen, you see before you, in blue jeans and misery, the wandering, exiled, trampled on, and suffering rightful king of France. Well, he cried and took on so that me and Jim didn't know hardly what to do. We was so sorry, and so glad, and proud we'd got him with us, too. So we set in, like we done before with the Duke, and tried to comfort him. But he said it worn no oh, use, nothing but to be dead and done with it all could do him any good. Though he said it often made him feel easier, and better for a while if people treated him according to his rights, and got down on one knee to speak to him, and always called him your majesty, and waited on him first at meals, and didn't set down in his presence till he asked them. So Jim and me set to madestying him, and doing this and that and t'other for him, 
and standing up till he told us we might set down this done him heaps of good and so he got cheerful and comfortable but the duke kind of soured on him and didn't look a bit satisfied with the way things was going still the king acted real friendly towards him and said the duke's great-grandfather and all the other dukes of bilgewater was a good deal thought of by his father and was allowed to come to the palace considerable but the duke stayed huffy a good while till by and by the king says like as not we got to be together a blamed long time on this eight year raft bilgewater and so what's the use o your being sour it'll only make things uncomfortable it ain't my fault i warn born a duke it ain't your fault you warn born a king so what's the use to worry make the best o things the way you find it says i that's my motto this ain't no bad thing that we've struck here plenty grub and an easy life come give us your hand duke and let's all be friends the duke done it and jim and me was pretty glad to see it it took away all the uncomfortableness and we felt mighty good over it because it would have been a miserable business to have any unfriendliness on the raft for what you want above all things on a raft is for everybody to be satisfied and feel right and kind towards the others it didn't take me long to make up my mind that these liars weren't no kings nor dupes at all but just low-down humbugs and frauds but i never said nothing never let on kept it to myself it's the best way then you don't have no quarrels and don't get into no trouble if they wanted us to call them kings and dukes i hadn't no objections long as it would keep peace in the family and it warn't no use to tell jim so i didn't tell him if i never learnt nothing else out of pack i learnt that the best way to get along with his kind of people is to let them have their own way End of chapter 19 you have listened to adventures of huckleberry finn by mark twain